Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global, our first hour's general discussion about media and virtual production. Second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. Today, we're going to talk about iPhone production. So a lot of us are doing a variety of things from training videos to even broadcast pieces live and recorded all on their iPhone or phones or Android as well. And so we'll talk a little bit about that in the second hour. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about um, photogrammetry with our phones. And so that's also becoming something that a lot of us are doing, capturing uh, 3D environments and models uh, with our with our phones. We'll talk about some of the software that makes that happen. Um, so that's what's coming up in the next couple of days. Um, remember that uh, we're starting to do um, some stuff at nine o'clock after the show. So uh, Ken Jordan will be talking about website construction and management tomorrow. And uh, Richard Lavery is going to be talking about Universe on Thursday. We didn't put that in the thing this morning, but uh, it'll, it's going out. So Thursday morning at 9 and, of course, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we'll be talking about Isadora with L. So um, stay tuned for that. All right. Let's jump into the questions. Uh, Bill, what do we have? Our first one comes from the Seventh Scroll, the team in Brooklyn, New York. And he says, or they say, morning, guys. When wiring for Dante, are you using two different Ethernet cables into the Mac Mini, for example, one for Dante and one for Internet? Go ahead, John. I always recommend separating the two networks. Uh, if you have to, you can run them over uh, both the same, but an ideal where those are always separate. You don't want any sort of collisions. You don't want the computer making decisions about what's more important. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, I agree with uh, John there. I have uh, two, and I've been wiring this in my head, two switches, two different sets of wires going into my M1. Yeah, and you can definitely do it all in one if you have a simple Dante network. But as you start to make it uh, more complex, you, you often want to think about um, definitely separate VLANs that are protected uh, and then sometimes ex uh, separate, uh, entirely separate networks. Uh, go ahead, Guy. Yeah, apologies for the last second there for the guys in the back. Uh, there was some 10 gig problems too with um, the Mac Mini. So uh, John Prado's nodding his head. So I just want to throw that one in there. You definitely want to add a second adapter for Dante specifically on those models that have the 10 gig, the iMac Pro and the Mac what Mini. What was M1. the issue? It just didn't, didn't work. Didn't yeah, work. There, was... <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Doesn't work. All right. Uh, next question. Uh, comes Actually, it's more a comment from our friend Thaw uh, Lopez Waterman. He says, just to comment, the answers about my ATEM Flickr yesterday. Totally awesome. Turned out it was the adapter, USB-C to HDMI. I changed it over to the control monitor and clean second show. And it's just saying thank you, office hours. No, it's great, John. I would just say, always start at layer one. That's your best way to move up the OSI model when you're troubleshooting. Typically, it's going to be something at the physical layer. Uh, it's going to really help you. Uh, once you have a troubleshooting model down, it's going to help you identify, resolve issues as fast as possible. Next question. Douglas Carmichael is up next, and he says, an emergency response plan. It was mentioned that cell phones would be the main mode of voice communication. Wouldn't a mesh network or radio system be more reliable between individuals as it doesn't depend on a central mobile switching office? I go, Jeffrey. If a mesh network or a radio, uh, a radio system would actually be on a backup battery, it's, it's very possible. But the reality is that they're just plugged in. They'll go to, uh, and it depends on the emergency. I mean, the emergency might be that the tower goes down, the cell phones don't work. But the other emergency most likely is uh, the power goes out in a, in a system, backup batteries uh, or backup generators go up in the theater or whatever, and uh, the mesh network's not on that. So uh, if you have it properly planned out that way, yeah, you could actually use it that way. Good, Mitchell. Most of these systems are self-healing, so it'll uh, take up where something gets uh, dropped, like a tower falls, like Jeffrey was just saying. Uh, we almost always have walkie-talkies in our, in our case. So um, uh, it's very rare for me to show up at an event without uh, probably usually 10, 10, 10 walkie-talkies with their pieces. Um, we use them for a variety of different things. A lot of the venues we walk into don't have cell service. Like they just, you know, there's too much concrete, too much rebar. We end up with bad cell cell service. And so, um, and while we're getting our comms up, we use the walkie talkies to talk to each other. So we don't, run, we're not running around. Um, we've used, I mean, obviously there's Motorola's that we use for a lot of the bigger shows. Um, and, but we also have um, a lot of Baofeng, you know, um, you know, little ones that we use for other shows. And I got them for my kids and then I end up using them. But, uh, but they, some of them will go, miles you know and i'm not sure if they're i'm not sure if they're legal but they, they, they will go miles um and uh we've tested them two or three miles away and so they um so we definitely have usually a box of those and those are specifically if we lose power uh if we lose connectivity if something happens we and there's a handful of us that can keep moving things forward and figure it out before we without having to run back and forth around a venue uh next question 
Next one comes from Todd Davis in Hutchinson, Kansas, and it's a hypothetical for the group here. You're new to the Office Hours universe. you got your internet, your MV7, your lights, your Brio, and background all going. You've added a Stream Deck. What's your next purchase? An audio mixer, software, ATEM, Telestrator? You already have lots of Macs and PCs. Go. Go ahead. Go ahead, David. I'd kick it back and say, well, what are you looking to do before you say what's the next purchase? Because what you're trying to do is going to you know, dictate what the next purchase should be. If you have a lot of PCs and stuff, a video switcher might make sense. But if uh, it's not in your workflow or what you're trying to produce, then it doesn't. So just kick it back. I'm at work right now with just the Brio mic and lights and, you know, all my other gear is at home. Uh, yeah, good, John. Same. It, it all depends on what you want to do. If you just want to acquire stuff, we can give you a list uh, of a uh, hundred items of things so that would be cool things. to own. But <laughs> it really comes down to making sure that, hey, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to accomplish? And let's let's help you, you know, solve whatever problem that is versus just acquiring a new cool set of gear. And go ahead, Car uh, Carl. So the Brio is pretty good, but I would probably use a Brio as a second camera, like an overhead or over the shoulder. Um, so an ATEM, even just like an ATEM vanilla would be all right. Um, and then a camera, a DSLR is kind of good. You don't have to go all the way up to a Blackmagic. You can probably get something for half the price, like the Canon M50. Um, it also does webcam, so you can actually bypass the ATEM altogether because it does USB out. Um, but yeah, so something like that. But there is like, literally, there's a million things we can suggest to you as far as products, but need to think about what your workflow is. ATEM switcher is a pretty good one though. I go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, you're mentioning the office hours uh, universe, and um, I would say a mix pre six would be the way to go. Oh, that's kind story. I've got a concept out of Portland, Oregon, that would be great for you to start winning about story because without that, you don't need any of that gear. And or I've got a Tuesday night class that I attend for stand up comics. I go ahead, guy. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the teleprompter. I kind of accidentally stumbled into grabbing this one from the office and bringing it home and it hasn't made it back to the office in two years so i'm in love with this thing so i'd say prompter and then the other thing would be a ptz camera usually i have one behind me and that helps with the over the shoulders and automating it especially if you can get those dialed in with stream deck presets yeah, go ahead doug uh, kenneth more internet dual homed if you can do it bring one <laughs> in from the left and one in from the right yeah, I'd probably lean towards the ATEM with, you know, some some cameras, you know, um, that you can. I like the Blackmagic cameras because you can control them. So they are more expensive, but you can shade them. Um, and that I, I find that to, shading and being able to reestablish focus without having to go play with it is for me a big deal because my camera is behind something that I can't I can't get to. So it's it would be um, that, that's that's the key is having those those two integrated. That and the mix pre is probably the things that I would look at next. Um, next question. Comes from Fred Eric Eckert in Bad Herrenam, Germany, and he says, what are the latest experiences with the Zoom event platform? Anyone using it for serious production, and what are the alternatives? I actually don't know anyone using it for serious production. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know anybody using it. Um, you know, I think that uh, a lot of us are, um, I think that we build more bespoke uh, kinds of events. So I think that Zoom events has a place. It's just that this group is more of a, we'll design something that is just what you want, not something that you kind of want. <laughs> you know, so, uh, and I think that that's the challenge with all of the competitors and everything else is the kind of the turnkey solutions um, don't solve the problems exactly the way we want. And we're the kind of people that can make that happen if we want to. Uh, go ahead, Sky. In the beta form, we were trying the previous iteration of event and it's was allowing us to do the uh, ticket sales at the beginning and the entrance there. Mm -hmm. It was again in beta, so they've done a lot with the event platform since that time. So they're continuing to iterate. Yeah, now go ahead, Guy. Yeah, I'm still experimenting with it. And I have two licenses on our enterprise account that are a thousand seats, so, or a thousand, yeah, thousand users. So, uh, if I'll extend an invitation to anybody in the group who wants to learn it. Uh, hit me up in Discord, and I'd be happy to let you play with these licenses because I would love to see them being used and get the platform up and going. And these are 1080p webinars, so hit me up. And I know I sound crazy, but I'm, I'm going to keep saying that we're over the next five years, you're going to see us transition more and more to regular events that are not as big a deal and not doing singular events. You know, so things are just going to be more, more low key and often than they are big things because it's just we were doing that because we were doing big conferences and events because we were constrained by time and space and with zoom we're not and it just doesn't make as much uh doesn't make as much sense um but we're it's going to take time for event companies to get their head around that um, next question 
Next one comes from Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida. He says, I'm planning for a hybrid event by at the end of the summer. Any updated advice on theater in the round plenary designs? Thanks. Good, Carl. So my, my advice would probably be more on the lighting. So generally what you want to do is you want to make sure the people on stage are at about 2,000 lux and you want to make sure your crowd who's in the round about 1,000 lux. So if you can cut to the crowd, you've still got enough light to actually see the crowd. But you do want the crowd to be probably one stop darker than the people who are on stage so they don't take focus. Um, so just a cheap light meter would be what you'd want. So if you get up there, so you, all the other things, you've got cameras, switches, there's a lot of other equipment you're going to need to do it in the round. But the most basic one is to get your lighting ratio right between the crowd and the onstage talent. So the on the crowd behind don't take focus away from the onstage. Go ahead, Bill. Everything he said, I, 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 the first thing that concerned me when I read this question was lighting, because if you want to get cameras surrounded, if you particularly have a uh, theater or something other than just a fixed panel where you know your, your singles, your two shots and your crowd shots, coming back to wide shots means you're going to see your other cameras and your operators and things like that unless you can get them back and that's that control of lighting so that the whole room doesn't become the main focus and every shot doesn't get confusing and people are searching for what they should be looking for in anything uh wider than a close-up so it just it's a lot of fiddling to get that right so um, a couple of things to think about there. Uh, you have uh, the, the way that we've done them in the past that we think that are probably the best way to put them together right now is 12 foot circle in the center is what you want. You want, you need six feet for egress. And then what you do is you build, uh, you know, thirds around like this. You always, no matter what you do, if you're going to create breaks, um, always break them in odds. Um, because if you break them in odds, what happens is, is that it means that you have a camera in, in this break and you always see people on the other side. So um, so that's, you know, technically that's one thing you wanna think about there. Then the other thing is, is the, the best way to do this is to actually do bleacher style. So if you can get, curved bleachers are almost impossible in case you're wondering, but if you can, get them or build them. Um, but curved bleachers are really cool um, to go up here, <laughs> think about uh, the padding. Uh, it's, it's uncomfortable for too long. And then on these, you can put screens up here. And what that means, if you get it right, um, is that it's pretty easy for somebody on one side to look at, you know, just kind of look over at one screen if they see something and it's, it's, they're not, no one's cranking their neck um, to see what's there. So if you hang those screens there and then you can bring, again, you can have a lighting rig up here and then bring it all down. Now, the other thing you want to think about, and, and then you just, you're basically by, by creating that, that um, lifted area, the people in front of you are actually the, the set. So you don't have to build a set you spend all the money on the on the people. Um, the thing you need to do is you got to shoot this with super 35 or better because you want them out of focus. Uh, otherwise it's just get, they, they get confused. They get distracting when they're behind. So, um, super 35 or full, full frame is uh, where you want to go with this. Cause you don't have very long shots. The cool thing about this is about 200 people will be within, you know, 30 feet of the speaker. You know, so, uh, it really just pulls it all, all in. If you're going to do it a, a hybrid, that's in my opinion, the, um, that's after, being paid a lot of money to do a lot of hybrids over the last decade. That was the, the, the pinnacle of our, uh, of our designs. Um, next question. Next one comes again from Fred Eric Eckert in Bad Hannernalb, Germany. Follow up to the Zoom event platform question. What about the Vimeo virtual event platform? I've heard actually good things about the Vimeo event platform, but again, I, I think that uh, I haven't, again, most of us build them from scratch, you know, so we're, we're, we have complex switchers and so on and so forth and, and build them out. We don't use kind of an off the shelf solution for those things. Um, so I don't, I just don't know. I, I think maybe it's just the circles. I mean, if we're going to do something off the shelf, the thing that I would um, look at, I guess, and, and we could have brought this up on the last one is uh, in our group, uh, uh, Blue and, and Grant have uh, Obvio, which I think is super powerful, you know, and I haven't needed, I haven't had the opportunity to build theirs, but they're building them where it can be a meeting for a hundred or a meeting for 30,000. And you don't have to worry about what that looks like. And I think that I would definitely look at Obvio as a, um, as a, as a platform. And we keep on meaning to bring Blue on to talk about it. I don't know if we've ever actually had him come on and talk about it. He came on, he was one of our first second hours long ago, um, as he was working on getting into the, uh, virtual events and he was doing things for a thousand people, you know, and, uh, but now, uh, it's uh, it, so that obvio would be another one that I would check out. Um, next question. Next one comes from Rupert McQuay on Dallas, Texas. Other than the big names like Apple, what brands do you enjoy purchasing directly from the manufacturer rather than through a distributor or retailer? Uh, go ahead, Carl. So there is one brand that you can only buy from the uh, 
manufacturing that's tesla so in the in especially in south australia the, the power products from tesla are very popular i think there's a hundred thousand homes with power balls and uh, solar from tesla um so that's one company in australia that's they're generally worldwide as well that you buy directly from the actual manufacturer go ahead mitchell almost all my software I buy directly from the manufacturer i mean i can't tell me how many times that I bought something because it was a special deal or it might've been a little bit gray area. Mm -hmm. um, and then later on, I've gone back to the software manufacturer for an update and they don't have any record of the, of the software. So it just makes more sense to buy direct. As far as hardware goes, very hard because a lot of the manufacturers protect their distri distribution channels. Um, I, would, I would be inclined to talk directly to any of the companies with, that you're having problems getting delivery and just complain, hey, I tried uh, your uh, your distributor, mm -hmm. but uh, they can't supply. Can you? Yeah, go ahead, Bill. I was going to say exactly what kind of Mitch was hinting at. It's that distribution chain to go around it directly to the manufacturer. There's pluses to it and minuses to it. If you're a giant monster like Apple, which you mentioned, you know they have the credit cards on file. They have the security and all the rest of that. So I can feel pretty comfortable with a company at that size who I know has spent time on that back end stuff. If not, giving a whole bunch of information to uh, direct sales people makes me feel a little twitchy in these days. So I'd prefer to have a human being in a distribution chain that's more local to me that I can work with and trust. But that's just me. Go ahead, Tom. Well, it's not a big name, but it should be Rogue Amoeba. I like Audio Hijack and Loopback. Go ahead, David. I'm just going to quantify it with the word enjoy. I'll, just, I'll say nothing. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, so I, you know, I, I think that I, um, software, I often buy directly because of, uh, again, because of the issues about registration and everything else, the, uh, I only buy Apple products from Apple because it, it the, all the registration for, you know, the, the protection and everything else is just such a pain to do somewhere else. The, um, then, you know, a lot of times I do try to work with, I mean, at the, quantities that I buy things, I often have more direct relationships or I'm some version of a integrated integration reseller <laughs> for some for some folks where we don't, we don't sell it to the outside world, but we are technically and you know, we're considered an integrator. So I, I can do, you know, direct um, stuff. So, um, so a lot of those I'm, I'm buying directly, you know, from it, but I'm buying in large, I mean, as much as a, often a lot of their resellers are, I buy, you know, lots and lots of things all at one time. And so, um, so anyway, the, uh, uh, but I think that, um, for the most part, you know, I, I, I order it from DBE store. I order from Amazon. I order from B and H that's probably like 95% of my online purchases, uh, between those three, uh, organizations, if I'm not buying in, you know, bulk. Now, next question. Next one comes from uh, Craig McFarlane in Boston in the USA. Is there an HDMI adapter for the iPad that also supplies power? Uh, go ahead, Carl. Yeah, so regardless of which iPad you have, being Lightning or USB-C, both the Apple HDMI adapters have a power pass-through. So you simply just hook up your Lightning connector, obviously, to the Lightning one and USB-C. The thing about the USB-C one is the USB-C is just power only. The USB-A is data in, you know, so that's, you have to remember that with the uh, USB-C uh, AV adapter. Yeah, go ahead, John. Uh, USB-C, uh, if you have a dock, I use the StarTac docks with my iPads, which is nice. It'll provide power provides ethernet as well as hdmi out and bill just pulled out one from my system lightning to hdmi and power i use this on my ipad all the time so i don't have to worry about the battery going bad when i'm using it to uh, through the atem yeah, all right, next question next one comes to us from george kennedy in washington dc what do you think of the new announcement from adobe premiere pro and after effects now include frame io for creative cloud go ahead george so that announcement came out this morning. Um, so it's, it's now in Premiere Pro and After Effects, like I said, um, you get 100 gigabytes of um, frame IO storage. You also get access to um, camera to cloud, which is there. Um, you could build out a system that could push uh, the live files directly to the cloud. Um, there's some more things gonna come at NAB, I'm sure. So it's, uh, I think it's a good step for the Creative Cloud users. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, I've seen it, and it's it's actually pretty impressive. Uh, so basically, it just integrates right into Premiere. You'll you'll see all your clips there in a pool. You'll be able to organize your clips and then uh, put it into your timeline as you go, uh, which is pretty impressive. But the more impressive thing is their color correction, their automatic color correction, which is really really impressive on how how it's uh, how it's fixing things. 
Go ahead, Sky. As I do have the subscription, I'm very interested in this. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, David? Uh, just a comment. I was wondering, does, do we know if Frame.io allows you to bring your own storage? Like if you have an enterprise level uh, AWS infrastructure, can you attach that in? For some reason, I think that there's some integration with S3 and I, I don't know what it is, but for some reason, I, I, you have, might have to do a search for S3 Frame.io, but I think that there's some way to uh, co do, put it in cold storage or something because it is in S3. <laughs> it is in S3. So um, I do think that there's some sort of integration. I don't know if it's a true integration where you can see it in one place and put it in another. I do think it's a great thing for Adobe users. And and I think that Adobe is, I think, pretty aggressive about, and I think in a good way, making that subscription more valuable. Because I think for a lot of us, it was a frustration that it was just like, well, we'll give you the apps that you used to buy. And um, we'll just charge you every month for it, <laughs> which was really frustrating for a lot of folks. So, um, and a lot of us have kind of, because of the way that that structure was, a lot of folks have moved away and tried to, or if they still have it, they're trying to use something else. Like I open everything in Affinity first, you know, and if I can't figure out how to do it relatively quickly in Affinity Photo, I'll go, I'll go to, I still, you know, I still got Photoshop, to, you know, so, um, but, but I've used Photoshop since 1991. So it's, it's a different, you know, there's things that I can just do in my sleep um, in that app, but uh, After Effects, I've almost completely replaced. I mean, there's a handful of things I still own. That I still own all these Adobe things, but I'm but people like me are constantly trying to do it everywhere else because you know we look at the cost structure. We have a lot of people, and it doesn't. It's just not. Um, it's not sustainable for a small company to to do what what they're asking. Um, next question. Douglas Carmichael, Western Electric, and heir to the X Bell system manufacturing arm, is gearing up to expand into guitar amp tubes from their current hi fi tube line. Given the versatility and fidelity of modern modeling, could you see a market for said tubes today? Go ahead, John. There's a huge market for tubes. Uh, guitar amps are still manufactured um, using tubes. Uh, most players that you see out there um, will use maybe a combination of both uh, a, a Kemper or a fractal unit, uh, as well as live tube amps. Um, there is a difference to how it feels to the player. It's very hard to tell a difference between um, like what you're actually hearing, uh, especially within a produced studio environment. Uh, but I would say uh, as a player myself, I enjoy the, the feel of a tube amp, uh, but I love the consistency of a modeler. Go Jeffrey. Yeah, I also love the tube amp, uh, and and one of my uh, guitar player uh, brings in a tube amp. Uh, it's it's I'm it's night and day. Uh, the tube amps uh, they brought them in be simply because of the fact that uh, most tubes uh, were produced in Russia, and now they're going through all these uh, trade or uh, uh, transfer issues, and so uh, what they decided, okay, well we'll just make them in the United States. So that's why it's happening. You go, Carl. So this issue is is pretty much localized to North America because we get everything via Hong Kong from Russia. So there's no embargo there. Um, but yeah, you're right. So the tubes are still, it's, it's like tungsten globes. So tungsten globes, while there's certain types of tungsten globes in the homes that are hard to find in movie production, tungsten globes are very important because they have a CRI of 100. So there's very, there's a lot of reasons. So for the same reason why we still see tungsten globes in, in production, we'll still see tubes in, in music and with creation of music and with listening to music as well. Good, Kenneth. Well, all purchases are emotional in spite of the technical details you might look at and the fact that a modeler can make this thing sound like that thing. Purchases, when it comes down to it, people buy what they like. And so there will be a market for this method of producing sound, even though it might be able to be uh, duplicated by 10 different other ways to do it. People know what they like and there will be a market for it. Yeah, the, the advantage of all analog formats is that they are imperfect, but infinite resolution. So they, you know, they, they, you know, because it's, it's, a, it's, it's, so with digital or any kind of, you know, facsimile, we are dealing with a limited resolution. And the question is whether your tools and whether your ears can actually hear the resolution change, but there is uh, an a analog always will have an advantage of having that infinite resolution to work with. Um, next question. Next one comes to us from Matt uh, Halverson in Brookings, South Dakota. I ordered a new M1 14-inch MacBook Pro. Uh, can I plug three different USB mics into it and get three different recording tracks in addition using a MIDI 2012 MacBook Pro? Thanks. I don't know if you can do that. I mean, there's so many mixers out there that um, uh, there's a 
you know, there's a lot of mixers that will just give you all those tracks, you know, a lot of interfaces that you can put those tracks into. I think that you would, you, you may be able to pull it off where you have a different device picked for each one inside of Audition. Um, that might be possible. Um, but the, uh, yeah, if, if, and if, you, if it's working on your 2012 MacBook Pro, it should work on anything else. This is a so, more of a software issue. So if it's already working, then you're fine. I would really look into a, a some kind of interface like a Flow 8 or something that is going to, you can plug multiple channels into, you can have individual control over them, and then you can send them as individual tracks to your recording device. Um, you know, those are the things that that's going to be a much better solution. But if it's working on your 2012, it'll definitely work on your new MacBook Pro. Uh, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I just wanted to note that that's one of the reasons these outboard hardware boxes have become so popular. I'm using a Thunderbolt Universal Audio Apollo Solo, and it gives me access to 10 tracks in the interface by virtue of that. So sometimes the outboard hardware makes this easier, if even if it's possible originally with the stock unit. And I think that this, I'm going to cancel this and push this back to voting. We, we had a question pop in there that was... Really, it's listed as first hour, but it's really a second hour question. Let's go to the uh, next question. Uh, this entry level gimbal question, or no, 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 no. Okay, that popped back. up. I, I was obscuring me. I see. Uh, okay, so we're going to uh, Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. I'm going to want to film a funeral coming up with three NDI cameras. What would be the best way to bridge them into a cloud production? Uh, go ahead, John. I would use the NDI bridge. It's going to be able to. Uh, I'm sorry. If I'm the wrong John, but just no, no, you're it. You're, you're it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, the NDI bridge is what I use. You can send up to 16 um, channels of audio and video up using that. I would highly recommend testing, understanding what the bandwidth looks like. If you're going to try to cloud production, capturing a funeral is a one-time event. Uh, you don't want to mess that up. Uh, go ahead, Guy. Yeah, I was going to recommend Bridge as well. It is still something that you, you really want to test the heck out of because it's PC only and there are some quality settings that you can adjust. And so you want to be careful as to how far you ratchet that up. I mean, you can go all the way to 4K H.265 and uh, you just want to make sure that that is a solid workflow. The, the way that I would do it is uh, SRT. I would kick it up either software or hardware SRT get it up to the, the cloud so it's it's nice and stable. But the first question I would ask is, why do you even need to go to the cloud? If you, if you can, uh, parsec into a local machine, and that way you're not sending up three separate feeds. If you can just parsec in and cut remotely, then send out one feed. Uh, so it, it, it can be a bandwidth thing as well, uh, how stable is your up. And because uh, if, if you're trying to send three, uh, you know, 12 meg uh, connections up and you only have 20 megs up, you're you're going to run out of bandwidth. So the question is why? And you just want to make sure because uh, there's there's the whole backup issue too because you, you want some redundancy there. I go ahead, uh, Jeffrey. Yeah, I second that, especially because we don't know what cameras you are going to be using. If you're just basically using iPhones with the NDI plugin, as opposed to like a bird dog or something like that, you, you probably want to have something close to the source that can handle it. Uh, and then, uh, like a uh, guy said, uh, put it on one machine, send it up that way. Next question. Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania says, recording to an SD card in a home studio with a Sony a7 III camera, is there a recommended method of bringing in a Focusrite 2i4 interface to record the audio to the SD card? And he's hoping to avoid adding audio in post. Good, Carl. So, yeah, you can do this. So you can just simply use your Focusrite as a, a preamp. So the way to do that is you'll have to come out of the headphone. So you're going to do a direct monitoring of whatever's coming in. So you've got two channels coming in. So you simply come out of the headphone with a, uh, a 3.5, well, actually it'll be a quarter inch, and then convert that to 3.5 and plug that into your audio in on your camera. Um, if you keep that cable short enough, it shouldn't be a problem, but it's no different than, it's, you know, the way we used to do with DSLRs with like, you know, all the other type of adapters we used to put on the DSLRs for audio. But if you're in the studio, because you'll need power for the focus, right? That'll work. So simply come out of the headphone. You have to keep an eye on levels in your camera. So you have to judge the headphone volume on the on the focus right, but you can do it with the equipment you have right now. Yeah, I, I and and I would say that there's a whole bunch of problems that can happen here, and I would really think about think hard about a dedicated system like Zoom makes one. Obviously, the um, the Mix Pre three has a or in, in six I think they have a, a a screw through them to to actually let you attach them to cameras. Um, and there's Beach Tech, of course, was the one we used to use. All of us used in a long time ago. I don't know if they're still around, but we haven't used them in a long time. But there's a lot of ones that are built for this. And I think that the Focusrite 2i4 is not built for it. Um, I think, and, and you could really end up not getting audio that you expect and, have, and spending more time 
fiddling with it, uh, in my, in my opinion. So I, I would think hard about that solution. Carl gave you a great solution for it, but I would think really hard about using it. Um, next question. James Haldale in Vancouver, Canada. We got a lot of numbers here. I'll try to do them carefully. I put an HDMI and this one was 1080p 60 hertz into a decimator, but it only outputs 1080i 60 hertz to SDI or 1080i 59.94 hertz back to the HDMI out. I had to go HDMI out to a second decimator's HDMI in in order to output 1080i 59.94 hertz SDI. Is there an easier way to do this? I go ahead, Carl. Yeah, so using a video assist from Blackmagic. So that's that's yeah. just my, my personal thing. So the video assist from Blackmagic, you could put HDMI in, convert it to whatever you want, and pump it out. You could even convert SDR to HDR. So that's just my simple, like the decimators can do a lot of stuff, but the video assist from Blackmagic is the ultimate toolbox when it comes to this kind of stuff. I don't think, I, 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 a decimator should be able to do that. Like, I'm not clear why it's not working. My only guess is, is that um, if you're trying to get SDI out, you just want to make sure... You want to make sure that it's set to scalar and not HDMI input. So you have to um, you have to make sure that the outputs of the SDI and the HDMIs are set to the scalar, not to the HDMI input. Um, and so I think that that may be uh, what's happening here because we've definitely I'm, I'm almost certain we've done what you're trying to do. So that's the part that I'm, I'm confused by. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Either that or the decimator is older, an older model. Yeah, older like ten years. I mean, like if if it's, I mean, MDHX, Possible. an MDHX should be able to do it. So if you're talking about an MDHX, uh, then it should be able to pass that through. And I'm confused by that. Yeah. So I think I just make sure. Let us know if it's if you used it in scalar as a scalar. Uh, I mean, you have to set output to scalar, and then you set the scalar to what you want it to output. But it won't do it automatically. Um, or if it, if it isn't working, doing what you expect it to do, make sure that's that's the case. Um, next question. Eric Nathan in Bellingham, Washington is up next. I'm considering a Blackmagic Web Presenter HD to pair with our Blackmagic TV Studio HD. Currently, we use BoxCast to rebroadcast to Facebook and YouTube. Has anyone had experience with it? And if not, what are the eternal alternatives? I go ahead, George. So I that's my main um, encoders right now. I use two, a main and a backup. And I do carry one of the 4K versions as a, a third, just in case I have any issues. I have not ever had any issues with it. I, you do need to learn a little bit if you live with XML, cause you're going to need to, if you need to put in custom inputs, black magic doesn't do a lot of presets. So I would say the biggest hurdle is making sure you understand XML and, and being able to put in your own numbers and, um, bit rates. I go Jason. Yeah, I, I, I have several web presenters and I, I absolutely love them. Um, I would check out here to record. Um, if you're not comfortable in XML, um, they, there's just so many resources and they can actually generate the XML that you need and show you how to put it in. So yeah, pretty good stuff. And for the, uh, for our, our, our producers, we're just screaming through these questions. There's a lot of questions for the second hour. So if you, if this is a great panel with a lot of great answers. And so if you, if you have general questions that you want before the end of the hour, we are halfway through and we're just moving through them really fast, um, then throw those general questions in. Otherwise we will start the second hour early. And I, I think with the number of questions, we can probably hang on to that. But if you have general questions, this is going to be a great morning to, to ask those. Um, so um, next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next. He says the Novation Peak Synthesizer combines fast 24 megahertz digital oscillators on a uh, field programmable gate array with analog filters. And he's got a link there. Would the high speed of the FPGA mitigate the resolution barrier, as you mentioned, Alex? Uh, Carl? So I own the Summit, which is uh, the Peak times 2 um, with the keyboard. Um, so FPGA is not digital. So just keep, keep, you have to kind of the output of FPGA can be um, analog like it's programmed digitally but an fpga is a little bit different so you can actually have an analog workflow through that and the Ox oxford oscillator which is inside the peak and the summit um, actually does if this and that in an analog style and it outputs the function you actually get some pretty crazy oscillators out of it as well but the peak and the uh the summit are analog synths with uh, fpga oscillator there's no digital in that synth at all so don't confuse fpga with digital so a, a digital oscillator would have a dsp oscillator which is a little bit different um they do exist of course um i have i have many digital synths but don't confuse an fpga one with a digital or, or dsp oscillator um it is much better than an analog oscillator because it doesn't go out of tune and like this is roland went to digital oscillators you know like way back in 1983 
So this is something that's been around for you know, 30, 40 years. Uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael has the next one. He says, what have your experiences been with the face with face ID with a mask in iOS 15.4? Now go ahead, Jason. Uh, not delightful because in general, I'm also wearing sunglasses. And then of course, I'm just kind of an amorphous blob. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, I totally agree. I, it never really worked. That's why I like my Apple watch because then it'll just unlock my phone. Easy, <laughs> easier. Um, yeah, go ahead, Ken. Plus one for Jeffrey. Um, yeah, I can't get it to recognize me even without my glasses on, which means it's recognizing my glasses. So I could lend that to somebody else and they could, I, I'm not happy. That's not good. <laughs> um, yeah, the, uh, uh, I, I just have given up and just put my, my code in. <laughs> I don't try to do that. I, I just stopped trying to, trying to actually figure it out. All right. We are now going to go into the uh, into the second hour early because we cruise through a ton of questions in the first hour, and then um, uh, yeah, you can't for the folks on the back end. You can't if once I if you don't if we don't get that right, you can't you can't go black while I'm talking. <laughs> so so if you're behind, you just have to just give up. Um, all right, we're going to start the second hour again, and uh, so we're talking about. Um, uh, uh, phone production. The reason we're talking about that is a lot of us are using the phones for a lot of different things. So if you have any general questions, before we go into the questions, if, if, if the hosts have, or the panelists have anything they want to say. But I think that, you know, this is becoming more and more important. And, you know, a lot of, one of my, uh, my most viewed things, if you, if you search through, I don't know if you, anyone can find it, but it's somewhere on the internet. Um, one of my most viewed things was when the iPhone, the second iPhone, the iPhone 3G came out, it had video. The first iPhone, we were like, oh, this is going to have, you know, the next one's going to have video. The next one's going to have video. And when it came out, I grabbed onto a Red Rock Micro. Um, this is, I don't know, probably 2007 or 2008. I grabbed onto a Red Rock Micro um, kit, tore it apart, put a bunch of other little weird things on it and put it over my shoulder like a shoulder mount. And I was like, this is the future. This is what we're going to do. And and uh, Wired picked it up. So it, it was um, millions of downloads unfortunately for my server um anyway so the uh, back then when it cost money and it wasn't on youtube uh so um so anyway that that little uh, uh piece was really talking about what was going to obviously happen and i think even back then we knew when i when the phone had the video on it that eventually we were going to start tying things in and doing things and now we're seeing uh more and more production you know happening uh, with these phones and the reality is is that in many environments, I think the phone is doing better than most cameras, definitely in the same price point and oftentimes twice the twice the price uh, of the phones. Uh, and they're much more convenient. They're always with you and, and you have a lot more flexibility. I mean, there's still a lot to do with it. But to get the most out of it, and the reason we, we have the second hour is to get the most out of it, you really need to, to add some tools to it, <laughs> add some features and add some rigs and so on and so forth. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, what it takes to do that. We've t talked about these in like as an answer to questions, but we haven't really dug into it for a whole second hour. And in this case, probably an hour and a half uh, where we're going to talk about this. There's a lot of questions um, uh, about it. So I, I felt pretty confident in just jumping over to the to the new conversation here. So uh, go ahead, Bill. So for the for me, I've been doing more and more and more with my phone. And I think some of you who uh, watch the Office Hours space uh, process realize that I didn't even take any of my standard cameras out to the lake bed. I knew it was going to be a signature event, and I wanted to get some good video and coverage and things like that, supply B-roll to the team doing the edit. But I finally gotten enough confidence, decided to do just that. And boy, did it feel good when I got back from there with really good video and some really good stills. Now, all that said, I mean, the, the computational photography aspects of it, how well it shoots video, HDR, all of those things built in the camera were all huge uh, advancements. The fact that it's a sealed unit means that I was not constantly worried as I used to be with my bigger cameras about the dust of that environment really messing things up. The two areas where I'm still having difficulty, first is sound. It's just getting sound, decent quality sound into it. I have a bunch of lightning connector things, uh, things like the Ceramonic little uh, on-camera mixer, and it is possible to do the standard wireless audio into it, even two channels, but it requires me hanging more things onto the camera than I would otherwise like. And it makes it difficult to do one of the things that hugely worked for me, which is the fact that a phone on a gimbal is an incredibly powerful and smooth shooting rig. 
So that and the the inability to to have real control over things like lenses and zooms and things like that. Yes, you can pinch to zoom, but it's nowhere near having a lens kit on a regular camera. As they work towards making those two things more and more accessible, and I'm sure they will, better audio IO, maybe doing something with Bluetooth that really does a good job of audio in and out, and something that allows the shot to be altered in progress so you can maybe set up a zoom and have it execute over time, that would really put the last nail in the coffin for me as it becoming my primary shooting device. And it's funny, that's always like a, it's a difference between a film, someone comes from film and TV, because as a film person, you never notice that it doesn't have zoom because, uh, you know, it doesn't have any kind of zoom control because you never do that. <laughs> like, right. like, we, right. you know, yeah. like, you know, EFP like, versus ENG. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, like we just, like we never zoom in. Like we just, we, you know, um, you know, so I, I, I had one person I asked, so did you, are you going to use a, a zoom in the shot? And the guy pointed, my camera operator pointed his feet and he goes, these are my zoom. <laughs> you know, so, so anyway, uh, go ahead, Mitchell. I have mixed emotions about this uh, process. Uh, I know that ultimately it's going to happen uh, using your iPhone or your or your mobile phone to do uh, high end video, but the problem is I think it's counterproductive uh, to what it is that we offer in terms of services, and I, I I'm very regretful to uh, to I I wouldn't walk into a high end client uh, with an iPhone. Um, Maybe if it was something specifically where they don't care about how I captured something, that way you'd be it. But uh, I see people offering seminars and how to make your iPhone a camera, and it's uh, more and more being snapped up by people in corporate uh, environments uh, as a cheap alternative to hiring a professional uh, videographer or DP. Mm-hmm. So th- that's where my my dilemma is. I respect what's happening with them. Uh, I recognize that the technology is getting better and better, and there's a lot of things you can do with them. Um, but it's like when the first laser printers came out and people started setting their own type. There's a lot of bad photography being done with them. Yeah, I, I, but I will say, <laughs> I was the I was the person doing that. You know, like like so so when we were uh, like so when I look at a lot of these things when they were, you know I was the kid getting paid. I got paid seven dollars an hour to reply to lit- seven fifty an hour actually, um, to replace the ad agency at prime sports network, <laughs> like, you know, like, so, so the, and, and they saved a lot of money by paying me to do that. And I absorbed so much information and I made horrible mistakes and I did all kinds of stuff, but they laughed because they were saving so much money, um, on, on, on hiring me. And, um, and I was able to learn now for in that period of time, the 1992, 93, 94, um, time, we had ray gun and we had all these other things and, the, and you're absolutely right that it was it was suddenly this new freedom and all these whippersnappers came in and took took all the cytex work and took all the a lot of the ad agency work and everything else but what came out of it was a much more creative like the, the you know there's always this thing like something new new technology comes out it suddenly democratizes a bunch of things and then it's chaos and then when it settles back down again there's solid production that's way more creative than it was before because a whole bunch of new people came in, you know, and it's no longer tired. It's no longer what it was, what we do all the time. It's, it's fresh and it's interesting. I mean, I think that, and and I think that when we look at the, a lot of the folks, I mean, we, we do services and I don't bring phones for service, you know, to do services for clients. Um, I do it for time lapse and stuff, but I don't, I don't expect to show up in front of them with a, um, with a, with that. But we, um, but I think that there's a huge per, a group of people that are doing it for themselves. And these are news gathering company, news, news, you know, reporters. Um, this is, uh, but also all the social media, everything else. I mean, you, you, you know, really there's this whole other world of people producing content right now that has nothing to do with a service to a client. It's just their own content that they're producing. And I think that's where the phones get really interesting where you don't have to prove anything to anybody um, to, you know, you're just building the content yourself. And I think that, again, we see very creative uses of it. If you watch TikTok, TikTok is just the, this cauldron of, of, uh, of creativity of people playing with things that, you know, that are disposable, but they're learning how to create an entirely different way of telling a story. Go ahead, George. So I guess the biggest question uh, is right now, you know, when folks see these massive commercials from Apple, you know, as a, using an iPhone, it's a lot that goes into that production. They use in high end production companies to do it. But would you look products like what's uh, the small rig cage it allows you to have a little bit more control over rigging an iPhone. Um, also, my thought process about it right now is I don't really want to use my my everyday phone for production. So do I 
purchase a few iPhone 13s, you know, you're going to spend in excess of a thousand plus dollars a piece. So, you know, you could spend on a 6K, it's going to cost you about two grand. Do you really want to invest in iPhones just to do production? I think, you know, it's a good idea if you're going to get into doing those kind of productions. I think it's it's coming to, it's coming to, um, it's coming of age where you, you, you're going to see more of these in productions. I think for some, they're not going to use it, but I think for right now, for folks like us that want to experiment, it's a, the direction we're going to go in. I go, Jeffrey. I remember my first CES, and uh, that was back in 2008, 2009. And I took this little guy right with me, and I put it onto a tripod, and I was... Uh, uh, we, we put in a wireless microphone to this thing and it com completely changed because we were running Panasonic's for all our main camera shots and everything like that. And I remember walking around with this thing on a, on a monopod and everybody was like looking at it and, and, uh, and really impressed on how I, we made this turn out from there. For YouTube, it's perfect for stuff like that. So I love the disruption of doing CES, as you said stuff that's my own as opposed to other people's there are things that are missing when it comes to to doing phone things like optical zoom i still have a camera that uh, several cameras that will uh if i need to go 20x uh to the stage or something like that i'll do that over there but my last ces was this little guy right here which is the dji osmo uh pocket 2 and then of course with that screen being so small in there i use my iphone as the as the monitor from there so it wasn't the main camera but what it was was an addition to this camera plus with other phones and yes i've kept all of my iphones because i i had this one sitting in my pocket because when i'm when i'm doing this to do uh, interviews i can i can take this one and create b roll from the uh, product. So when I get back to the uh, hotel or, or whatever, I can then uh, do any type of post production, put it all together. Uh, TikTok's a uh, perfect example. As an Amazon Live influencer, everything runs through the iPhone, not an Android. Uh, so if you, want, if you wanted to get onto their system, you have to start here unfortunately. And then the last thing I'm going to say is that uh, don't, don't discount Android, don't discount iPads, because of course, they're going to, they're going to add a whole bunch of value to the phone production as well. I will say that I, I am working with a lot of influencers. Uh, the only influencers that I see use Android are people who are getting paid to. <laughs> like, you know, so they're getting paid to put, to, to show them using a Samsung or something like that. But the, it is, it is so dumb. And Apple just dominates that entire space, yeah. you know, the, um, the, the big I don't advantage, know exactly why. The big advantage of the Android, I've talked about this before, when I, we did our at-home kits, uh, mm -hmm. I, I did all Android on the at-home kits simply because of the fact that TeamViewer, all I had to have them do is say yes to, to one question, and then right. I could control the whole phone from there. Apple, you can't do that, unfortunately. Yeah, and I will say that, you know, I went to CES and NAB and lots of things covering it with EX1, you know, Sony EX1s and XL, you know, Canon XL2s, and we covered Mac World and, and uh, all these devices. But within a couple of years, I had moved completely to just using my phone. You know, like it was just way faster, way easier. And, and I was not, I didn't see any, I mean, it, in some ways I felt like it was actually a better solution. Like with a little phone, what I, what I can do is one of the things I would do is I would just look at this thing and then I'd swing down and look at this and then I look up at this and I would go through someone's booth and I would just kind of figure out where I was going to go. And then I just do it. And it was so fluid and the image stabilization on these cameras now, I mean, on the phones is so good that it, it may not look like it's rock solid, but it doesn't feel shaky cam, you know, while you're using it either. Go ahead, Chris. I love this topic. I love, I love when technology disrupts so um, completely. Um, I think one of the things that's the most impressive to, or the most interesting to me is watching it happen over and over and over historically. And as I get older, um, looking back at all of the people digging their heels in, like we will absolutely not use that technology and then that one of two things happens. They either acquiesce or they go out of business. And so all of the people say, I'm not going to do this. Uh, th they are, they potentially, you know, have all your clients. Also, Jeffrey, I love the fact that you said, I didn't actually use the phone for my main camera. 
but your main camera was smaller than the phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the um, uh, yeah, it's I have made it my business model to basically go from one disruption to another. So I I, I look at disruption as that's a, that's this the next wave to jump on, <laughs> you know, like and and when this one when I'm on one, and so usually I'm not even interested. If something looks like it's not going to be disruptive, then I'm like, well, I can delegate that to somebody else, you know, because I'm not. It's not the not the place that I like to like to live, and so I think that this is it's an exciting place and. One of the, for, for me, one of the things that just kind of turned the corner uh, was when I was walking, I, I talked about this in one of the, one of the answers a couple of weeks ago, but I saw, you know, this was actually, this is before all this, this was years ago. I saw someone from RT1, you know, the Russian television station was standing outside of the apartment complex in DC doing just a hit, you know, for, um, you know, just for the, for their, for their channel. And they just happened to, you know, our apartment looked like DC, looked very quintessential, like. Um, DC and so or where where it sat and so I, I watched them and he had like a little tripod and he had the phone and he had the light on it and he had a microphone and he and it was just I just was like wow they're really just he's just he is doing something that's gonna be on national television with his phone and then I started paying attention to it in DC there's a lot of reporters and I started seeing it everywhere like I suddenly realized all these international um, reporters are all using these iPhones as their as their contribution device and it was just a really fascinating because they just don't have the budget anymore to do like a whole and there's still stations that send a whole sky and bbc and everyone else they, they'd send out two or three people with the host and and usually do a stand-up that doesn't look any different than the, one, <laughs> the ones that are being done on the phone uh, go ahead ken so here's a story um there's there's this tale that everybody's heard about the uh, fellow with the car who won't start and he calls it uh, mechanic over and the mechanic lifts up the hood and and hits the back rear corner of the engine block with a hammer and says try it now and it starts and the mechanic hands the guy a bill for five hundred dollars and the guy says what that's outrageous give me an itemized bill and the fellow says okay fine hit the car with a hammer five dollars knowing where to hit the car with a hammer, $495, and that's the end of that. So what you have here is a, is a conflict between what's called enabling technology, that is hardware that makes tasks easier, and skill stack, the ability to use whatever you choose as your technology to produce a good product. So while any kid, even me, can buy an iPhone and go take a reasonably acceptable photograph or, or film, what do I do with that next? And so the job of, of producers nowadays is less one of knowing which camera to buy, and I think more and more of being able to sell that skill stack to the customer. And I, and I think that the, one of the things that's important is, is that the, when new people come into a market, they don't have an already always way of doing things. They don't have a, this is the way. Now, that means that they make a lot of mistakes when they get started and when they come out of the gate. But they're also, this is like new thing that they're kind of playing with and they come up with new solutions. And I always, I never want to like, I, I do things in a very specific way, but I always look, I'm always watching what everybody else is doing. So for instance, like a good example is I'm still very much like I do production with SDI <laughs> you know, and HDMI, maybe HDMI, but definitely copper but I very intently watch everybody here doing cloud, <laughs> you know, like in very, like I'm watching, watching all that and, and figuring it out and I'm experimenting with it myself and doing those things, knowing that that's coming, you know, that, that I know that that's a disruption that I'll be, want to be part of eventually and just not yet, you know, and, um, the, uh, so in the same way with phones, you know, I was, I was, again, I was, I built a movie the first day that the iPhone had video. So I was excited about it. And, have experimented with it for a long time and failed a lot. But what I what I will say is one of the big things as a just as a person is having great shots for my iPhone that they show up on my galleries and stuff like that that I shot with my iPhone. I know where it came from. I have a GPS of where it came from. I captured it. It's been automatically saved. There's a whole bunch of other things just as a individual that's very empowering. Go ahead, call it, Carl. So the way I've always looked at the iPhone is kind of from first principles. So I've taken a look at like the specs of the iPhone. So you, these are essentially specs of the iPhone 13 and similar to the iPhone 12, the telephoto is a little bit different. So if these lenses and these apertures make sense to you and the light you have available to you for whatever you're shooting, then the iPhone is actually a really good B camera, amazing B camera. It's got an excellent backup battery built in, um, you know, those kind of things. The other thing about the iPhone is it's very accessible to uh, camera operators who may need to throw them fast. 
So if you say, hey, look, I've got this iPhone, it's just some little clamp, we'll put it on top of a small tripod. Can you just make sure that, you know, the, as you, you know, the headroom, that, those kind of things, um, just follow the person around, those kind of things. Um, they won't be intimidated. So you'd be very hard to find a 13 year old who's intimidated by using an iPhone in production. So you can employ a 13 year old if it's legal to into your production and they'll, they will feel very comfortable and they will switch lenses to telephoto and, you know, when you ask them to, they know how to do that. So it's the barrier to entry to get people in. And I think this is kind of good for um, houses of worship that may not can afford an expensive setup. You can actually bring in older iPhones. People can donate older iPhones to uh, the house of worship and they can be put into an AV production. And then it's easy to get volunteers because the, the entry level to get into understanding how to use it, just put on a small tripod, a little clamp, it's fine. Um, audio will come in through a different mean, of course, but you can do quite a lot with 1080 out by the uh, HDMI adapter the iPhone and probably one to 2000 lux of light. Light is a key thing here because we're talking one third inch sensors. So if you've put in 2000 lux of light on whatever you're shooting, the one thirty sensor will be perfectly fine. And, and the, the other thing is, is that the, uh, one of the things that I think about a lot is for education, this is like the tool to use in my opinion. Like if you're an educator trying to build content for your, for your classes, um, I think that, you know, I almost all the training now that I do, I just pull out an iPhone and do it. You know, if I'm going to train someone on hardware, I'm not going to use a big thing because I don't want to go through the infrastructure. Like, I just want to shoot the thing that I need to shoot with, with the phone. It's going to be perfectly clear. And in a lot of ways, being able to switch to macro is amazing, you know, to be able to show something really clearly. You know, go ahead, David. I'd just like to springboard on that concept and, and put this to the group and, you know, with the draw full of older stuff that maybe is used for an occasional thing, why not put that in the hands of an underserved or... Uh, group that maybe can't afford the latest and greatest thing and see what they can do with it, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and that's a, it been a lot of, uh, it's really important for people to tell their own stories. I mean, that was the big reason I went to Africa and started doing training and then built a school in Rwanda was that I think that people have to be able to tell their, they have to be able to be capable of telling their own stories at the same level. And so the disruption that creates from these phones, um, part of, part of that is that I think to your point, they, they become way more, available for, for us to see what the rest of the world looks like um, without, you know, needing all the other things there and get that view, again, from the people who live there and experience it, not from um, uh, someone from the outside. Right, that citizen to, journalist kind of. Yeah, I mean, and, and some citizen journalists will be problematic because it's their, it's their view that they're trying to push forward. But at the same time, you know, I watched, you know, one of the big things that was really driving force for me was um, sitting in Zimbabwe uh, during the elections in 2000, watching uh, CNN International report on it. And the entire city, I was in the city <laughs> at a bar watching the elections and I could see the reporter and it looked like there was this, these huge crowds, you know, and what, and when I looked out, the streets were empty. And I was like, what? So I walked around a little bit and I saw the reporter, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, shooting this. And it was like 10, 15 people dancing around but the reporter had raised their raised the camera up a little bit to make it, you know, to, to drop it off so that you didn't see that there was only 15 or 20 people or 10 or 15 people there um, to tell, because that's the story that they wanted to tell the rest of the world. And it really dug into, like, I, I haven't been able, I, I never recovered from that moment, like of watching the news. Like it went through a filter of, I have no idea what's happening there. Like, like, I don't know, you know, like I, my trust level went way down in like literally in minutes. And I really saw how important it was for us to get lots of views of that of that problem. I don't think that any one of them is accurate, and I don't think that citizen, you know, reporting is any more accurate. Uh, it probably is less accurate, but with more samples from more different directions, you get, you know, you you triangulate the truth. Um, go ahead, uh, Tom. Well, I use the iPhone for documentation and just so many things from the. The moment a piece of equipment comes into my home, I'm making sure that I document the serial numbers and MAC addresses and so forth so that when they show up on my network, I know what's what. But beyond that, the versatility of the iPhone to be able to put this, uh, I've shown it before, this small rig cage onto it, that's $40. And yet then you can attach a mounting plate to go to a tripod or a slider if you wanted to do B-roll. Uh, cold shoe mounts, you've got both horizontal and vertical, quarter 20 on all sides. They're, the the versatility is just amazing. 
Uh, go ahead, uh, Mitchell. I think I'm going to be the guy that's going to be the counterpoint to a lot of what's being said here. And uh, it, I, I, I'm speaking to anybody that's in a professional production business where they, they hire their services out to corporations or big companies. And the minute you bring uh, an iPhone in, as good as it is for a lot of the applications that you mentioned, which are good, educational, documentation, those are good. Um, you're going to have the client looking at you and say, what are you charging me? I mean, and I'm saying, well, wait a minute, you know, an RE uh, has this depth of field and I can zoom and I can do all of these great things with it. And they're going to look at it and say, so it doesn't look any different to me well, that you shot with an iPhone. And in reality, a lot of uh, people that you have to justify what it is that you do are going to look at that and say, I don't see the difference. Maybe there's a huge difference, but they don't see it. And if they don't see it, guess what? You're stuck paying or charging prices that are way below your normal rate because of this march of technology. I'm not against technology. I'm just simply saying it's a bad sell for people in our business. It's like uh, well, you just I, I discovered know. fire and you now introduced it to the cavemen. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's if it is a. Uh, I don't know if a lot of us are are um, bringing iPhones into production. There are definitely clients that I've had that we are required to bring use iPhones or, or phones in general into it because one of the things is, is that this is another reason to think about production. This is how I really got into it was like heavy production with the phones was because um, some of the social, like, so for instance, this is a good example. You want to shoot a video to, to Instagram, you need an iPhone, you know, to, to do that or a phone, an Android phone will work as well. So now you need to understand all the production related to that because that is something that you're going to need to do or it's going to be really complicated um, or and break the TOS and so on and so forth. And for a long time, that was the same for Meerkat and Periscope and, you know, many of these TikTok for a long time, you had to be able to use an iPhone to be able or, or a phone to be able to actually do the production. So I think that those are cases. I don't think that I'm going in to do an interview with a phone. Um, although I will say that we had a, um, I think I've told this story before, so I'll keep it quick, but we had a broadcast truck go down. Um, we lost the broadcast truck um, and everything was out. And we had a CEO of a very large company, um, you know, that is gonna walk down a red carpet at a certain time. And we were bringing the truck back up and you know we needed that clip 15 minutes before and someone ran out with her iphone and shot shot the clip of him going down the thing came back and we quickly uh, you know loaded it you know loaded it into the play out and played it out as the beginning of the show and no one was the wiser and we had you know we had it was an eight million dollar production with uh you know a, a 54 foot double expando truck and we shot the open uh in uh with it and again we just wouldn't have had it any other way because everything was triax and the and the truck was down no go ahead sky how do I follow that story? I, I feel like I'm at a 12 step program. Hi, I'm an early adopter. Uh, I too have, uh, you know, bled into the future and I've watched DSLR take over from the, uh, the big Ikigamis and I've seen the iPhone continue to broadcast out immediately versus having to transcode it and send it through a satellite dish and the, the million dollar 53 foot production truck. So the two words that I'm struggling with, it's, it's the, the polar question between Mitchell and Kenneth is the attitude of the client and, and how do we justify well, our existence? And, and again, I, I think that I'm not, and I'm that's not, the I, use don't, case. I yeah. don't think about it through the lens of a, of a contractor. I don't like, that's not my, that's not my problem. I'm looking at it as a lens of, there's just a lot of people doing production with these phones. And so you, sure. what we're here to do is serve anybody who wants to communicate. I don't really care whether they're trying to sell a service to a client or not the the I'm, I'm you know this this show is as much for the clients who want to shoot with it and the individuals that want to communicate i don't really care whether we're selling it when when a business no longer becomes viable i just move on to the next business well, like so you know and I've, value, I've done that like eight or nine times value so. and attitude and i think that's the the, the center yeah. point of that with kenneth and, and mitchell is the attitude is that you're you're hiring the talent not the tool well and, and and, and I just look at, I look at, um, my job is to take um, pixels and put them on people's screens. Like, it's a very simple thing. I don't think of myself as a shooter. I don't think of myself as sure. CG. I don't think of myself as, you know, like anything else. I'm just putting pixels on screens and I'll use whatever I have yeah, access to to do go. that. And and when the version that I'm, I have no longer is tenable, I just move on to the next version. Like, you know, and it's, and you just keep moving forward um, because, you know, hanging on to the past is, is a fool's errand. Well, um, go ahead, Jeffrey. That's why stories are eternal. Yeah, absolutely, Jeffrey. It reminds me of that meme, the uh, picture where the guy's got the the video camera and the headphones and all that other stuff and and everything there, and then of course the phone 
And it's like, okay, we've now replaced it with this. And that's that's where we're going on here. And it's very important, once again, to, to say it's more than just using it as a camera. And I'll give you the perfect example. It's what I've been talking about for the last couple of weeks with this uh, top director. Uh, I have a switcher on this phone using conventional cameras, using an iPhone camera if I want to, being able to port it in and uh, be able to put overlay a graphic on this thing overlay uh, text on this thing, and then sending it out through uh, up, up to 1080p to a source. Now it can do the program out so I can actually send it straight out to this kit, to this system right here. And, uh, and nobody will know it. it will be the wiser as long as the system stays up. Will it crash? Yeah, it can crash. It has crashed before. Uh, it has caused some problems that I've had to fix. But once again, uh, hardware does the same thing every now and then. Uh, again, that this camera will crash or this switcher will crash, as well. It's just uh, it's just how you really trust it and where your backups can be. So phones can be more than just a camera in your production. Uh, from everything from calling the shots, doing a doing a clapper. I know that there's an app mm -hmm. for a clapper for that. That that's perfect. Things like that. Yeah. I will say that when we started doing the cooking thing with with Demianti, I first had a bunch of big cameras and I very quickly have one camera with a bunch of phones because, you know, of my older phones, because it was just way, it was like just way easier to rig up each time. And so, it, and I didn't think that it was making any difference. <laughs> Go ahead, Guy. Yeah, it's amazing what some folks are doing with the phones and it's it's about the reach. I mean, every once in a while you see something that's overly polished and some people just don't want to watch it because they know that it was really well produced and they just want the the raw, like gritty phone kind of shaky cam look. And so uh, I was meeting with a TikToker here locally that's got millions of views. And when he was saying some of this stuff, I'm like, I'll just help you with your audio because using your phone, like you're, you're doing a good job. You're obviously getting millions of views and I'm not. So <laughs> I'll, I'll teach you how to get great audio, but you do your thing. The other thing I want to show you guys is um, this uh, Simpty event where the NFL draft of 2020, they used Lyrix Broadcaster on iPhone 11s. Uh, so it's basically turning an iPhone into an SRT contribution. And so for the draft, they had an AWS instance running uh, Sienna, and then they had management consoles, remote producers, remote talent, and they were tying it all together. And then they were able to kick it back out to HDSDI at a control room, all using Sienna Cloud. You don't have to get Sienna Cloud. I'm, I'm doing some of this stuff with uh, other, other pieces of the puzzle that like SRT mini server will allow you to bring things in. And uh, the ability to just take a remote contribution in 4K, and I'll, I'll do it every once in a while with, with some folks here. In fact, I'll, I'll, we should make this an after hours thing. I'll show you guys what we do. We take vMix and we just make a nine up box like this, and then I'll cut between each person and just let them contribute. So you get a QR code and on your phone, you just scan the QR code and it pumps in the address. So this is an iPhone. This was, I think, Dennis's phone. And then I just cut between them all in 4K. So this is a 4K stream. This is a 4K iPhone. And it's just sending it up. And all the programming was download an app and scan this QR code. You don't have to do anything else after that. It takes it all in. So um, it's amazing what you can do uh, with phones and a uh, SRT uh, ingest, either in the cloud or locally. But yeah, these, these were all just people doing this. And I'll set this up again in after hours. I mean, it only cost me like two, three bucks an hour to run this thing. So again, it's just nine, nine inputs and they all just are coming in through phones or people can send up uh, desktop machines as well. But uh, just wanted yeah, to show you guys that. I, I, I think that that's really interesting. And that's just the layer, that's the lyrics receiver in the cloud or is that Sienna? Is that what that you was, using? that was just vMix uh, on that right. one. I think I might've had SRT mini server up at that time. I'm, I'm kind of distancing myself from that Russian software at the moment. But yeah, typically I would use the SRT mini server, but I'm kind of shut it down for now. Yeah. The, um, uh, cause I think that's interesting that what is hard and what we saw with, uh, what we saw with the, um, uh, with the, that, that draft was the latency is a little high with SRT. So you could, you, you could feel it when they were trying to go to the folks, there was a little bit of lag that was there, but, but I think that what really does work is single contribution. So, uh, in those areas where I'm going to go, I'm going to throw it to New York and then I'm going to throw it to, you know, London and then I'm going to throw it to, you know, Sydney and then let that person do a production from there, like take their phone and interview somebody or whatever. Now we've got a thing. Now we're going to go to this person. Now we're going to go to that person. 
and in those environments, I think Larix works really, really well. The back and forth, I think, is a little feels a little sluggish when people try to do Larix as a back and forth because it's uh, of the in, innate, you know, the the innate problems with SRT from a latency perspective. But but it's a pretty amazing um, production piece. Yeah, go, ahead, Bill. So I'm um, but when I, when Mitch was talking, it, it resonates partially to me this idea that the client expects a red shoot, and if they don't get a red shoot, they don't take you seriously. We've all run into that, I think, at some point or another. But I came to an epiphany some years ago when I realized that I wasn't really selling video or even producing video or anything like that. Really, what I was doing was solving problems for my clients. And you can do that with a lot of different tools and a lot of different methods, but convincing the client that you can solve their problem adequately in budget and the rest of that is really the only barrier that I have to get over. There are some clients you're going to run into where they have these ideas that have been put in their heads and they will not accept you unless you satisfy that. Fewer and fewer of them, I find, because the point is that there are more ways every day to effectively solve problems. And it is my responsibility as the person pitching to this potential client to convince them that I can solve their problems the best way in among my competitors. And if I can't do that, it doesn't really matter what camera I get a hold of. You can go out with a fabulous red rig, but if your crew isn't right, you're still going to get bad results. So it's everything. It's never the piano it's always the piano player, and that's what you have to do. I mean, I don't, I'm sorry, but me on a Bosendorfer does not equal Elton John on a crappy yeah. bar piano. It just doesn't, period. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that the, the one thing I will say is that um, that I am the epitome of I bring big hardware to things. You know, so like when I'm saying this, I'm saying it as a, as a you know, like I bring, I am very conscious to what gear I bring in front of a client because... I don't want to explain coming to an iPhone, whether I can shoot it with an iPhone or not, trying to explain to the client why something went wrong. I am, I have no, I, ha, I have literally, I'm, there's no, you know, no railing there. So, so, you know, you bring the hardware that, you know, even if you end up using the iPhone for, for, for some of the stuff or use it or whatever, it's not, you have to bring a rig to that. So as a service to clients, I have a very different approach to this, but as a personal producer producing things on my own for my own needs. Um, I use the iPhone a lot, um, but I also use the pocket, you know, in, in my world, the pocket cinema is considered a, um, oh, that's a little camera. It's cute. <laughs> you know, like, you know, and so, but I know how much, you know, what kind of quality I can get out of that camera, um, you know, and so, so I'll shoot that with that a lot, but I still need, you know, Ursa's for some of the stuff and I still need Aries, <laughs> you know, for, for some of the stuff I shoot um, because they, each one of them does have a step up in quality for a very specific problem. So it's not that we, these iPhones are replacing everything, but they, we, what we want to look for is number one is where do they fit in and where do they make sense? And, and then also how do we then maximize the production of those, of those phones, which we're about to talk to about as we jump into the questions. Go ahead, uh, Chris. Uh, yeah, real quickly. Uh, I was, uh, also listening to what Bill and, and Mitch were saying, you know, I'm sitting here and virtually every piece of equipment that I'm sitting in front of, um, with the possible exception of the microphone and the XLR cable that's attached to it, every piece of equipment that I'm sitting in front of was considered um, inappropriate for professional use at one point. Pro Tools used to be called slow tools because only, only you know, amateurs played with it. Professionals record on tape professionals edit on tape. They don't edit on computers. And and you didn't use anything but a CRT because LCD screens were horrible. LED lights were, were trash. And yet here we are in 2022. So virtually everything that we had, that we accept as normal today was considered amateur and inappropriate for professional use. Alex, I might be the exact opposite of your of your scale, you know, you, you know, bring the big guns, you know, drive the tank up to the grocery store. I actually relish the idea of showing up with as little as possible. And yes, I'm dealing with a different client and I understand why you do. I, I don't, I'm not trying to say you're wrong, of course, but um, I, I think that we have to be really careful when we say, you know, a pro wouldn't do that. I mean, we've said that about every piece of equipment that's in front of us right now, again, except for the XLR microphone. I mean, before I was an intern getting paid 7 an hour to do ads, I, I, I was working at a radio station and we, you know, the way we cut ads, we cut ads on tape. And so when you want to cut to the beat, you know, there's a lot of it, it was always, 
and then you'd pull it out and then you'd, you'd, you'd mark it and then you pull it out and you'd cut it. And if you wanted a, a crossfade, you'd cut it at an angle and you, you know, like there was all this, <laughs> that's what I grew up doing is cutting this tape from scratch. And, um, then this thing, I found out about this thing called pro tools and I slow didn't realize, tools. well, slow, but, but I didn't know that it had just come out. Like I bought it like three months after it was released in pro tools one, the hardware and it was like $6,000 and, and, um, and I was the only one in Pittsburgh that had a Pro Tools rig. And the funny thing was, is that, and this is like, I don't know, I don't know how old I was, probably 20 uh, at the time. And it was like all the money I had <laughs> to buy this thing. Because I was like, as soon as I saw it, I was like, you can cut so much faster, you know, from, from what this was. And I just cleaned everybody's clock. You know, like it was, it was like suddenly I was doing that because my product, my productivity was so high. I could charge less than everybody else because it was taking me so little time, you know, and I also wasn't going through tape and I wasn't doing a bunch of other things and I was, you know, going 10 times faster than everybody else. And it crashed a lot. <laughs> like, like it, it was like, you did have to save a lot and you had to know that it was doing, but it was still, even with all the trouble, it was still, um, uh, faster, you know? And, and so, you know, it, and, and we always have to stay open to that because again, the number one thing that all of the phone manufacturers spend money on is the phone, is the camera. Like the, the camera is the thing. It is the phone. The phone barely works as a phone anymore. I mean, it, I dropped so many calls that I don't even know if I should call it a phone anymore other than a mobile device that sometimes does calls not very well. Um, but the thing is, is that the, you know, if, if the rumors happen that Apple releases a 48 megapixel camera next, and they're starting to get kind of, uh, unrepentant about how big that bulge is. <laughs> they just go, we're just going to keep moving that out because no one's complaining. I mean, there's reviewers that are complaining it, but the average person is like, well, I, I just want a better picture. I don't really care how big, I mean, I could have that thing stick out half an inch. If I got better photos, I wouldn't care. Um, go ahead, Jason. Um, I feel like this gear thing is one of the oldest, like kind of most tired thing about like what is and is not professional that, that, you know, it always happens in forums and, you know, even discussions like this. And at the end of the day, uh, of course, you want to impress your client and you want to look impressive and, and you know, professional. Um, I feel like it's it's the luxury of being able to get away with things, um, but always producing, you know, the product that, uh, you know, that's good, that, and, that, and, that they're expecting. Well, and the thing is, is that you just need to know where you're, you know, where, because there are times you need control and you need a certain type of lens and you need a certain... You know, there are, there are places where I need 8K, 120 frame per second. <laughs> I need, um, you know, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that I need, but but you have to decide whether you need really, you know, like tomorrow we're going to talk about photogrammetry. I've been doing a lot of photogrammetry on my phone, but I also have used a BLK 360 and I've also used a Faro 350 and I've also used a ZN, ZNF. And I know where each one of those LiDAR solutions fits, you know, for, for my needs, you know, and I don't have, um, you know, I don't, I, I, there's some things, oh, this is easy. It's in my pocket and I can get, capture a model of this, or this is really small and inexpensive and I can take it with me. There's all these things that, that you can, so you just have to decide where, where it fits into the puzzle. All right. Now we're going to go into our questions. We've got a lot of questions stacking up. Bill, what do we got? First one from Joaquin Mattis in Imperial Valley, California. What are your must have iPhone apps to assist in production? Go ahead, David. Yeah, this one's really simple, but we use, uh, AJA key pros for uh, recording stuff. And then there's a free app, their little data calculator. Um, <laughs> Use it all the time. IOS. Yeah, it yeah. saves my bacon for uh, let me know how much space I need for stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Carl. So I'm going to put one in that's for a photographer. So it's actually Filmic Pro. So the interesting thing is with Filmic Pro, you can actually use it with an Expo disc, which is for getting white balance with your iPhone. It will equal 95% of what a you know $1,600 colorimeter can do so because it will tell you green shift magenta shift it will tell you the white balance um because you can put in 10 bit mode with Filmic pro it'll give you a very accurate color you know as far as what the green shift and what the red um the magenta shift is and that's what more i'm looking for when i'm shooting a fluorescence to do a mixed ambient with strobes so i need to gel my strobes to match the ambience if i'm shooting like a swimming pool swimming pools have these high bay mercury lamps which are very weird colors so i use essentially Filmic pro put an expo disc over all three cameras and just point the phone up at the uh, high bay lights and it would tell me the offset and then I can gel my flashes to that. And so when I'm swimming, you know, when I'm shooting in a swimming center, it works perfectly fine. So if I have to capture divers and stuff. So what are you putting over top? You're filming pro and then you're putting a filter over top of it? Yeah, so Expo Disc. So this was all the rage 10 years ago. 
probably one of your, one of your picks on Mac very quickly, to be honest. But yeah, Expo Disk, it's a white balance here. It's a white balancing disk. Um, it's not for exposure. It's more for white balance. But you can just point it at your light source. So you can point it at the sun, mm -hmm. technically. But you can point it at any light source. And I find it with weird mercury vapor high bay lamps and stuff like this, which give you really weird color casts. But I need to match my strobes um, to that. So I can take ambient light because they're very powerful lights. So all the shadows will have that color cast. So I simply can gel my lights with the correct green, use a green or magenta, and I'll put a CTO or CTB if need be, but I just layer them up and it will tell me. So Filmic Pro will tell me the offset that I need to do, and I can simply gel it up. Now I could buy a $1,600 colorimeter, yes, and that'll do the same job, mm -hmm. but I find this is really good production for the iPhone with a $50 Expo disc and a $20 app. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Jeffrey. The first app that I ever used, uh, actually two apps I, I, I used with my first iPhone was a uh, light meter app. And I don't think they make that one anymore, but it was it's a great uh, app. And then of course, uh, there was another one where I could actually do uh, real-time analysis. So when, I'm, uh, when I was doing a lot of sound, I could walk around and then find out how the audio was uh, being presented inside of a room. Uh, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't totally accurate, but it was really great. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go back to the top director and not just the switcher one because they have top director uh, viewer, which uh, if you have NDI and if you're running NDI, uh, you could have at every single camera station a phone running with a, seeing all the NDI shots right on your phone, right on an iPad. And, uh, and so you'll know if camera three is uh, off in the distance, if camera two is right on the, on the mark. And then you could switch to it or the camera operator will realize, hey, uh, I, there's, there's not a camera pointed this way and we need to have a camera pointed this way. So then they can uh, work with them to get the cameras uh, directed in the right spots. So that's, that's, my, that's the big favorite one that I've been working on lately. Go ahead, Bill. I'm going to go niche on you. Uh, one of the niche things that's actually used in pre-production more than in production, but I've used it in production too, is golden hour that tracks the sun and tells me what the light conditions are going to be like across the world as I'm getting out and ready to shoot. The other thing that I find has saved my bacon more times than I can tell you is having ready release on my phone. It's a simple release system. You build it up. You can have somebody, you can pop out a release and get it signed in the field. And that is, it makes my heart warm to know that anybody who does anything, uh, predominant in any of my videos, I've got an actual release for them. When you said Nishi, I was waiting for some uh, dark philosophy. Um, I was like, I was like, I was like, how, I was, I was waiting for like, how is Nishi, Nishi going to be, therefore, how is that going to, how is he going to integrate this uh, into the, into the conversation? No spiders, no spiders. All right, uh, go ahead, Sky. Um, talk about Soren. Anyway, the, uh, yes, film, second vote for the Filmic Pro. We use it in live production because of the ability to pass through everything and also have all the color controls and everything. And I use it on a, on a 12 and a 11 both and they, uh, in a live set, it looks great. Yeah. I think the, uh, one, 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 the two apps that I use that aren't like actual capture apps are the, um, um, uh, movie slate, uh, as well as movie slate will take time code, actually take, um, you know, LTC get time code and, and, and jam it. And then it, it'll run that time code for you. And you can, you can tap on it and it'll, you know, psh, you know, How do you and give get you it in? How do you get it in? Uh, through the audio in like headphone jack. Yeah. So it's, so the, um, so, uh, movie slate and I mostly use with an iPad, but you can use it with an iPhone and then also Cinemeter two from, um, Adam Wild, uh, and uh, it's just a great one. It has scopes and a lot of other information that, that I find particularly useful. The two capture apps that I probably use uh, the most are uh, Filmic Pro and Shoot. And the Shoot is a new one that one of our mem one of our Office Hours members uh, has uh, has is written in Sky Telestrator, and um, so uh, I use it a lot when I have it when I have a phone live into my mixer or in my switcher. I have the ability to shoot at something and then draw on it, um, and that's uh, I find that to be Super useful. Um, next question. Next question comes from our own Sky Gleason here on the panel from Seattle. Using the cinematic mode on iPhone 13, what adjustment do I need to use in Final Cut Pro 10 for this codec to edit color? And go ahead, Sky. And I will qualify that that Chris Fenwick said it's not a codec. So what I guess I'm finding is when we were out in the the desert out there, we're using a lot of cinematic uh, mode in my iPhone 13, and adjusting the colors is a bit of a challenge in final cut uh, 10 so uh, help. i don't know what the cinematic how cinematic affects that i think that it's capturing in isn't it capturing just in is it capturing in hdr i think that's the the thing you're probably not as used to is that there's an that's and i got a lot of 
when people gave me their their reviews afterwards, a lot of people used different, I guess, the cinematic mode, thinking that was the best. And bringing that into Final Cut so, uh, 10 was a challenge to get some well, of the colors oversaturated. Well, did, it, did it look oversaturated or undersaturated? Yeah, over, over, blown out. Right. So oversaturated means that it, so when, when something looks really blown out and oversaturated, it usually means that it's converting what it thinks is HDR to, um, to 709. Um, so it's seven, when you convert a 709 to 709 and you use a lookup table with LUT that is uh, HLG or vision to 709, what it's going to do is blow the whole thing out. So that's the, so what, what's happening when it looks blown out and I haven't tried it, so I have to look at what you're doing, but I know that um, what happens is, is if it, if it's a 709 signal and then it's interpreted as it, if the computer thinks that it is seven, um, it, it's HDR and it's actually 709 and it converts it to 709, what it does is it punches all the colors up because, um, and so that is applying a curve, a lookup table to do that. I haven't played with that footage specifically, you're more than welcome to upload some for me and I'll take a look at it and give yeah, you a more specific thing. Because both but I, Ash it's not... and Noah sent me files from their iPhones. Looked great, mm -hmm. but I, I couldn't get the I couldn't get the control. Yeah, and so I think that that's probably the, the issue that you have there. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I was gonna say specifically, they are, um, I think, Sky, the cinematic is specifically talking about the fact that it records it in such a way that you can refocus it later. You can select yeah. your focal point and getting the nod from Carl makes me realize I am indeed correct. And um, the, the, um, there is a tool inside of Final Cut called HDR Tools and it has a few settings. I have on most occasions found that if, like, like I showed you Sky, if you pull down to that second setting, it, it, it does it. But I will concur that I didn't notice the Ash footage, but the Noah footage, was super problematic and it didn't it didn't behave like the others did and i don't understand why either but yeah i'll send you a i could send i'd you love a to see the, to i'd love to see some clips because i can probably yeah. look at it thank you um th 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 there's a wonkiness to the so the the phone itself there's some wonkiness to the how it manages color right now because it's an hlg uh it's hlg but it's got metadata from um uh, dolby vision and so what can happen is is that the L and the HLG has a different curve than than Dolby Vision, that and so sense. if it doesn't have the metadata, if you get it without the metadata and it does, but it but it interprets it as Dolby Vision, what it'll do is it will um, blow it out. Like uh, if you went, hold on, you said if it doesn't have the metadata, Sky. Remember, I told you that both of those files are important. Maybe we have <clears throat> because file uh, Sky was using some what I like to call old timey file management techniques, I think possibly you broke the link to the metadata. You're yeah. welcome. Yeah, you gotta keep the metadata together. Yeah, Bill? Absolutely critical. And I was shooting with an iPhone 12 Plus on the gimbal out there and all of my HDR stuff just dropped right on the timeline and looked beautiful. So it was real simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead, Carl. So a very quick tip, that Photos app is going to be the native app for the phone, anything shot on the phone. So the reason is it's a Photos app actually has a software version of the ISP that's in the iPhone. Whereas technically, um, yeah, any other app, even Apple's Pro apps kind of have it, but that team has to integrate it. Photos app, so the day that the phone comes out, Photos is updated because the Photos app has to have a software version of the ISP. So you can undo all the metadata, you can take off cinematic, you can take off portrait mode. So Photos is the one where if you want to do a quick color correction, that kind of stuff, put into Photos and then just export it out of Photos. You will keep the HDR and stuff because Photos has all that, but you may find that Final Cut Pro may fall behind or there just may be too many switches you have to turn on and off to get the metadata correct. In photos, it just works. Yeah, I was using the camera app in video and it worked flawlessly. So I, that may be exactly what Carl's talking about. It understood that that format perfectly. Yeah, and, so, and you do have to kind of follow the path right now because HDR in general is, is a complicated path and it's, it's easy to, if you lose a piece of it, 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 it doesn't look nearly the same again. Let's go to the next question. We've got a lot of questions stacking up. Sure, Ike Potter in Hanover, Germany is next. He says, a gimbal made for mobile phones, IGA, uh, for example, the DJ, DJI Osmo series or a compact regular gimbal, for example, the G, DJI RSC2. What is your preference to be used with mobile phones? Go ahead, Carl. So it's going to be DJI. Um, the five now is integrated directly as hardware into Filmic Pro. 
So you can go into Filmic Pro hardware and add this. And so all the buttons on this will work. Filmic Pro, you can change your mode, you can go to manual mode. So this fully integrates Filmic Pro. So this is kind of a no-brainer. You can get cheaper ones out of um, China, but I personally like the uh, DJI one. Go ahead, George. Cars covered it. Mm. Uh, Jeffrey? Uh, the only problem to that is uh, I like these types of gimbals simply because of the fact once you put your phone on, you're going to start putting more stuff on. We've got now the DJI uh, mic coming out. That's got a little dongle that you'll be able to hang from the side of that thing. You'll have cords coming from that. And when you've got something more specific for a single phone, then the weight distribution is going to change. Plus, if you put a case onto your phone, then uh, these other ones are, are basically uh, set for just the phone itself. If you put, like I tried to put a, one with a case in this thing, it kept falling right off. So uh, those are the two things. I had a friend that had an older one and then he got a new phone. He had to take coins and put it on the end so he could counterweight his, uh, his uh, gimbal. So that's what I like about these is you can kind of have a little bit of a adjustability to it. I will say that DJI just kind of owns the space right now. I, I the, the registration process makes me angry, so I try to avoid it. And I went out and bought a couple other different ones because you can't, it won't even work until you register it, which is just um, obnoxious. Um, but I went back to them because it just doesn't, the other stuff doesn't work. So it doesn't work as well as the DJI stuff. They just, they have a lot more engineering going towards it. Uh, next question. Kenneth Jones in Seattle, Washington. Up next, I've heard a good deal about Filmic Pro uses Wi-Fi. Is this reliable, really? Uh, go ahead, David. I might be out of uh, sorts in answering this because I don't know Cinematic Pro, but Red Park is a company that makes uh, lightning to power over Ethernet adapters. They have a straight Cat5 to lightning cable if Wi-Fi is a, a worry, a problem point for you. Um, copper is always king. Yeah, and you can always put Ethernet into these phones. It's it's a really powerful way to approach things. Go ahead, Jeffrey. If you ever want to see it in action, just watch uh, conversations with Tony Mobley because I think he still uses Filmic Pro for his video. Yeah, and and I use uh, Filmic in a lot of different ways. When we're doing the cooking thing, I, I actually do I do share it to an Apple TV for a wireless camera. <laughs> so I have an Apple TV plugged into my switcher. And I have the phone and I just do, you know, I share, share the phone to the Apple TV. And now I have a wireless camera, you know, that's, you know, in my kitchen. I don't have to go very far. I don't know how far it would go, but it goes far enough uh, to make that actually work. So it is over Wi-Fi and it's, it's been completely solid. Every once in a while it gets a little out of sync. Like it, if you don't do anything with it for half the show, you might have to pick it up and give it a second before it's going to grab onto it. But it's, uh, it's usually pretty stable otherwise. Uh, next question. Chris Widener, Lafayette, Indiana, says, I have four main tiers of production, with phone production being tier one. For smaller gigs or meeting broadcasting, is the iPhone XR still high enough video quality, or is 4K going to be ac the acceptable norm anytime soon? And go ahead, Carl. So that, that particular, so the XR is a perfect phone. Uh, light is what you want. So to make an iPhone look good and good quality for video, just add light. So the more light you can add, the better. Um, pretty much you can go from a 6S. So if you have an iPhone 6S onwards, they do 4K 30 onwards. Um, they go 4K 60, of course, later on. Um, but anything from a um, 6S onwards, you can chuck into 4K 30, add one to 2,000 lux of light. What that kind of means is kind of 60 to 100 watts of an LED light. That's what you need at about probably two to three meters from your subject. Um, if you have a more broad space and just add two, two lights, um, but you can get a light meter and check, check your lux value. But yeah, so iPhones will look quite good. Make sure your lens is clean. So that's another thing. Just make sure that the, the sapphire glass in front of the lens is clean, no fingerprints. That's another big problem that you'll have with an iPhone. Um, but those two things, light and making sure your lens is clean and iPhone 6S onwards, not a problem if you give them enough light. They pick up, the thing to know about phones in general is that the little, those little lenses pick up a little condensation and all kinds of stuff around them. I literally wipe my lenses off every single time I shoot something that I care about. Like you'll just see me just immediately just wipe, wipe it off of something. I'll just always wipe, do a wipe real quick um, to make, and you'll be surprised at how much of a difference it is. The first thing we also do when people use their own webcams um, from their computer is like, hey, do you have something you can wipe that off on? And it's like taking this film off of the off of the webcam. We, we try not to explain to them what that probably is. No, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, pocket lint is not a transparent medium. Um, all of that, and I would just say that 4K is nice in that reframing afterwards if you want to push in, but if your delivery is 1080p and most of the people are going to do 1080p, maybe 1080i, there's still just as good a picture on some of the older phones, so they can be fine. Yeah. The next question. 
Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. Up next again, I use my iPad to edit short form content, typically shot on iPhones with LumaFusion. Is there any other editing workflows to check out? On the iPad, no. Like I really think that LumaFusion is the right one on the iPad. It's just a great app. It's really, really well built. And I would, um, I don't think that there's another editing, like post editing tool that is worth checking out on the iPad right now. Uh, next question. Uh, Clive Kirchner in Souk, B uh, British Columbia, Canada, entry level gimbal for the iPhone 13 mini. Good, Carl. Yeah, so I covered this before, but I think the DJI, you can have the DJI 4 um, or DJI 5. You can pick up DJI 4 pretty good second hand now. Yeah, now go ahead, uh, Jeffrey. What I've been showing are these uh, ones got by Hohem. Uh, so this is the Hohem iSteady, and then I would, that was the multi that I sh also showed there. These are around $50, $60. Uh, mm -hmm. You can find them on Amazon. Good, Bill. Plus one on the DJI Asmo 4 if you want to do something inexpensive. They're like 125 bucks now, and they're, they're really pretty solid. It's amazing. The hard part I have when I buy, I bought a lot of cheaper rigs and other rigs than the DJI ones, and the problem is, is you get an amazing shot that just gets hitched somewhere because the thing did something that you didn't expect it to um, that the DJI wouldn't necessarily do, and then you just wish you had spent the other because it was a great shot, and the only time you're going to get it, and now you don't have it. <laughs> so, so that's the, always the thing to look at as you start to reduce those prices. Next question. Sky Gleason in Seattle, Washington up next again with what with the new iPhone cameras and video software seems having stability built in. Do we need external motorized rigs? Do they fight each other if you use both together? Go ahead, Carl. Yeah, generally, if you have like a, an Osmo, like something like that, so you generally want to turn off the in, inbuilt stabilization that's built in because it, it will counteract it. Um, but there's another way of doing it too. So this is where it is kind of a good idea to shoot in 4K if you're doing records and then do software stabilization afterwards from a 4K image. Um, you'll get much better results. You want to kind of increase, you want to make sure you're at least a 180 degree shutter because you want it the crisper the image, the more stabilization is good. If you get motion blur in your, your frames, then it's harder to stabilize. I find after the fact. Go ahead, Bill. Carl covered what I was going to say. I'm standing back. Yeah. One thing I will say is that a lot of times I will um, shoot a little wider on even an Osmo where I can then use in post, I can restabilize it, but I've got some extra, you know, I've got a lot. And so if I shoot 4K for 1080, I may not, I may not zoom in. So it's a perfect shot um, for that. Now there's a bunch of problems with that in depth of field and, and other, you know, in composition, but, but I, a lot of times I'll do that because of the way I'm using the phone. I'm not trying to get the shortest depth of field in the world. I'm trying to get it to, to work so um yeah i would i would definitely um i leave both of them on <laughs> i don't have too much trouble they, they, they do wander a little bit but that's kind of the nature of stabilization so you just have to know that it's happening and usually if i'm doing it i'm moving the whole time so the wandering doesn't isn't as problematic um i shoot a lot of piece i shoot for editing so i don't ever i do very few long shots you know I, or I, if i do a long shot i'm assuming i'm just going to cut in and out of where what worked um next question Greg Gibson in Washington, D.C. One big downer about phones on Zoom is that they're 4x3 and not 16x9 natively. Is there a way to make a phone 16x9 in Zoom without third-party software? Yeah, go ahead, Guy. Yeah, this is something new that Andy Carluccio alerted us to that uh, you can now do. So if you jump over into your iPhone uh, settings, there's a HD video switch that you can hit. And then in the meeting, so this is a meeting that I just set up just locally. I hear a little bit of feedback, but yeah, here's my phone, and you can see that it's uh, 16 by 9 aspect ratio. Uh, go ahead, Carl. So the one thing to add to that is you can't be in a meeting to switch out, switch. So you have to be out of all meetings, go into your settings. It's actually uh, itself. So go into the settings, change the HD mode, then go join a meeting. So you can't do it while you're in a meeting. Okay. Go ahead, David. And bonus points, if you toggle over to the rear-facing camera, double tap it to solo it, you have the pinch to zoom kind of feature built in. Mm, there you go. Very good. It's, it went from being not useful at all to very useful. So yeah, it's definitely available there. Um, next question. Ted Claudio in Quezon City, uh, the Philippines says, what is your recommendation set up for connecting an iPhone to a dynamic microphone wirelessly for MOS interviews? Uh Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Man on the call. street, not MOS, which is without yeah, yeah. sound. Sorry. I, I was trying to process the same thing. I was like, without <laughs> sound, mid out sound. Is, is, I was like, I was like, I don't know. Like, well, you're not getting sound, but you're, so MOS can mean other things. So you just uh, go ahead, Carl. So the one thing I would probably suggest is you can actually use um, these kind of ingest so this is a USB C one mainly for android or ipad but you can actually get lightning versions so you can plug in essentially like a, a powered mic but you can also plug in a dynamic mic into these 
So they will work. Um, the preamps on these are pretty low, so you can't, that's that's the only problem is that the preamps on any of these kind of systems is going to be quite low. But this is one way to get it in um, wirelessly, and you just use one. You don't need a twin pack, of course. You just need a one pack. Um, there are other ways to do it that are a little bit wirelessly. It, it'd be a little bit more for spaghetti on your side of things um, to get it in wirelessly, but that's one way that's kind of set up. And you just got to plug um, an XLR mic in, but you will have a kind of a cable dongle going on because you're going to be taking XLR out and trying to get it into some form of system. Pretty much the Mix Pre 3 is kind of the best. And then if you can go out of the Mix Pre 3 into a Bluetooth, then that'll work. Yeah, and I think that there is a, I was just trying to find it, uh, you know, Sarah Monica has a ton of, I mean, they really pushed hard into this market. And so there's a lot of mic options there that are that are available. And I think that they have one that's like a shotgun mic that will also be able to go in via lightning to, um, or actually, yeah, there's a, um, yeah, it's a handheld microphone with a lightning cable for the iPhone. So the SRHM7 is, uh, you know, something that you might want to think about for that that kind of um, that kind of thing uh, go and my approach to it has been a bit more heavy handed, which has been um, a uh, I, I you know a sound devices with a with with a blue, Dante to Bluetooth um, works really really well. Just in case you're wondering, go ahead, Bill. You want to keep it under a thousand dollars. The Ceramonic has has these things, and they have a lightning connector on one end, uh, either single or dual XLRs. They have found a power if you want for some reason to use. Uh, non-dynamic mics but dynamic mics work just fine they also give you a real-time headphone outfit so it's nice to be able to monitor what's coming in so right. just another solution yeah good jeffrey if you want an alternate solution if you want the handheld effect here's one i 3d printed this little guy this is my <laughs> dji for my osmo pocket and it mm -hmm. slips right in here and if you put a uh if you put a uh, wind mic right I, no, I can't do it if you put a wind mic right on it it looks exactly like a dynamic microphone it is a wireless mic and the cool thing about these dji's is uh once you have them turned on you you, you can push a button here and it'll start any recording if you have it for the uh, pocket too it'll start the video recording as well so you don't need to go over hit the button come back and, and start your conversation yeah, and I think that the only difference here is this. This I guess this one that they have here is, you know, it's it's a regular mic. I'm, I'm just I just I haven't used it. I was looking for it. I was like, oh, I thought I saw a picture of that, but it literally just is USB out um, to the you know to that you can just kind of plug into your phone. Um, so it's kind of cool. Uh, next question, Ted Claudio in Kazon City's back. Uh, what is the best compact wireless mic system to use with an iPhone for interviews in noisy environments? I go ahead, Carl. So the noisy environments is a problem. So this is kind of where you want to mix pre three and you're going to want to wire it. You want to wire it to the actual iPhone. Wirelessly be a bit tricky unless you use a Bluetooth dongle. Um, other than that, then these kind of that are coming out now, you find the Godox one is pretty cool because it just the receiver just plugs straight into the iPhone. You don't have to have any cables. Um, but there are other brands coming out with them. But the noise reduction is going to be a little bit of a problem. This so way, mix pre three will come in, and as I said, you're going to need a bit more hardware behind you to get rid of the noise. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Jeffrey. Yeah, and it's important that if you get one of those, make sure that they have a lav and uh, and a uh, speaker option, so you don't have to have this thing pointed right at your mouth like this. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can put a lav and you go from there. I got this really quick. This is the uh, G GC Scene Real, uh, which is like the the uh, Road Go, except instead of two point four gigahertz, this is actually on a UHF system, which uh, I found in some cases uh, noisy as in saturated with uh with signal you might have a problem with those uh, other phones like the one that, or those other wireless systems like carl just showed you so this uh will cut through in a different way good bill just remember the form factor of the right of the right microphone will make a huge difference in a noisy environment if you can get a headset mic that sits right next to your mouth that's going to cut down background noise better than anything else just because of physics so most of those connect with either a little uh four pin uh, lemo connector or uh, maybe an xlr connector all of those can be adapted into wireless transmitters and get a wireless receiver on the other end i use the avx system by sennheiser but the g3s are good there are a lot of inexpensive ones that do a reasonably good job and that allows you to match the mic to your circumstances as opposed to adapting a mic that was designed to clip on your shirt or something that you can't get next to your mouth just think about that yeah, I mean, we've definitely used the ceremonics that that um, that Bill shows with SM58s, and that has worked um, exceptionally well. 
Uh, next question. Ike Potter in Hanover, Germany. Can anyone recommend a reliable lightning extension cable? And he's looking for something around uh, f uh, half to one meter in length to get the Apple Lightning HDMI digital AV adapter further away from the iPhone connector. Uh, go ahead, Carl. So there's a reason why this is, your word reliable is not going to work. There's a reason because the actual adapter has to be powered. The reason why is because it's actually a computer. So this is what's inside the adapter. You actually have an SOC computer. You have a lot of, and that's going to be powered by 30 milliamps at 3.3 volts out of the lightning. So if you extend that cable, you've got, you know, you've got a bit of a resistance. So it becomes a resistor, a cable. And so you're actually lowering down the amount of amps that can actually get to this. So there's actually the, a longer cable will act as a resistor. And so you won't get enough power to run it. So that's why there's, well, there's two reasons why it's short, because it makes packaging cheaper for Apple, shorter cable, but also they're running such low power to this computer that if you keep on adding copper to that, um, you just won't have enough power to run the computer that's needed to run this whole dongle. Yeah. And uh, go ahead, uh, David. Yeah, um, I, mean, I had a Ian Faith uh, Stonehenge moment when I make this recommendation by Saramonic, the DITC80. It's a little six inch cable, not half a meter. Um, but there is a company called like, um, CellularizeMe.com that sells a three foot uh, cable. You might want to give a shot, but as Carl said, it might not be that reliable. Yeah, it, I have tried to get a lot of the, co the cables that are HDMI, you know, they're lightning and then they go back. And then they're converted and it has just been like they work the first time and then they never work you know they don't work or they don't come on and you get this little weird qr code that appears and you know there's just all these weird things that they do and i just gave up and went back to the apple cables no the apple adapters um, next question chris widener in lafayette indiana's up next monopods for iphone use uh use are great what's your go-to suggestions for under 200 dollars i go ahead carl uh so manfrotto so you can actually get a, a video base monopod from Manfrotto for $200. It's it's more for photography or you know videography. You can stick an adapter on there. If you want the lighter weight ones, just look at the Manfrotto GoPro range. You can take the GoPro head off and put you know an iPhone head on. Um, they're a bit more lighter. They're kind of like um, beefed up selfie sticks in a way as well. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Jeffrey. Uh, Movo makes some great uh, some great creator kits that uh, you can set on table, have a little extension on there and go for I'd show you that, but my wife stole it because she likes it so much. Other than that, <laughs> If you want something bigger, I've, I've shown this before. The Sarui uh, has, uh, this is the, the $300 model. It goes up to seven feet. It's got humongous feet on the bottom. So you can set it down and uh, really trust whatever you're going to put on there. But they do have smaller versions uh, around $150 for those. And go ahead, Sky. I was just going to, I'm glad he showed the, the feet because that's the one I have on the Manfrotto. And that really, that's a huge value, maybe a little more expensive, but the stability that you like. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. On the playa, I took a monopod that I've had for, I think, 22 years at this point. It worked fine. I'm a little leery about the feet on monopods only because if you step away from it for some reason and you're tempted to when you've got those feet, uh, I'm just really leery about whatever's on top of it surviving the fall, but whatever. The next question. Uh, Matt Halvers Halverson in Brookings, South Dakota said, what is your favorite way to film a time lapse? Phone, GoPro, DSLR. I've recorded them with every option and I like the ease of use with the phone. Go ahead, Carl. So I find that the phone is probably the best. So here's me doing a LinkedIn photo shoot. Um, you just set it up and it just works. Yeah, go ahead, Jeffrey. I remember Boink's software having a uh, stop uh, film for the iPad and for the iPhone. I don't know if they make that anymore, but that was a really great program. I haven't used it in a very long time, though. Yeah, I, um, you know, so a, a lot of times I we, we use phones because they're convenient. If I'm really serious about it, I tend to use GoPros. Um, and, uh, and the thing that I do with the GoPros typically is I shoot video. So I don't shoot a time lapse. And the reason I don't shoot the time lapse is because I want all those frames. And the reason I use all those frames is because I take it into After Effects and I use um, Time Echo to re recreate motion blur from it. And I need the, what it does, what Time Echo does is it uses the other frames as the motion blur. So you can get this beautiful motion blur from your from your pieces there. So I tend to shoot video on a phone. It'll fill the phone up pretty quickly. <laughs> so, or it used to. Uh, and so I got into the, you know, putting in, it was just easier to put cards in to, to capture that over a long period of time. Obviously you have less ca capture. And I usually shoot 4K so I can, even for 1080p, so I can zoom in. Um, but I, I love, I love time lapses. <laughs> All right. Uh, next question. 
Sky Gleason, in Seattle, recording directly to an iPhone 13 in cinematic mode. Does it give me two files? What are they and what do I do with the sidecar file that comes with it? Good, Carl. So what it is, it's just a metadata. Technically, it is, it, it's not really a sidecar file, but it is metadata. Um, so as I said, if you put it into photos on, on Apple, you'll actually be able to turn on and off cinematic mode. So you'll be able to turn it on after the fact because it's not burnt into the image. And what it's doing is taking a depth map. So it's probably giving you between seven and 11 different depths. And you can, that's how you can change your ISO to, you know, ISO 1.0 to ISO 16. It's because allowing you to do that. And of course, of course, the iPhone is shooting a lot of depth. And I don't think, I just want to make sure that we don't, mesh these together the cinematic mode is not what's causing the color it is the hdr it's the shooting in hdr the cinematic mode is giving you depth the hdr is the problem you're having with color and that can be with or without the cinematic mode so we don't want people to get confused the cinematic mode is somehow causing color because it's not the issue um the issue is that it's shooting it's shooting hdr and i think that what's happening with your footage specifically is that you're because you divorced the video file from the metadata you have something that thinks that it's it's Dolby Vision, but it's actually HLG, and so it's convert it's doing a Dolby Vision to uh, um, 709 conversion as opposed to a HLG to 709 because that's what you have because you lost the data. And I don't even know how that I don't even know what that would look like without the data. So <laughs> good sky. Well, we'll we'll experiment because this sounds like a lab opportunity for us. Because I yes to Chris's point, I was using a software called Image Capture, and I was sucking the files off of the the drive separately, but it sounds like I need a lab of best practices because if Bill says he's taken his right off the, the iPhone, that is a, a tool. And Bill, you're using photo to take it off, right? I used photo to take it off. I had tried one in yeah. Filmic Pro and I got results out of that that weren't bad, but most of them I just used the Apple camera app, put it in video mode and shot with that. And it seemed flawless all the way through. I didn't have any problems with the whole shoot. Well, it's it's the transfer out is a lab that I'd love to do because yeah. that's where yeah. apparently I have old tools that are breaking. So things. here's part of the deal with that, because I've run across this in Final Cut a lot. You, It's hard to see because you're pulling the stuff off the camera and you think you're pulling it together. But often if you look at the directory, there'll be a little like MPEG or whatever it is, whatever the format you're shooting in video file, there also will be a little INF info, or sometimes it has another three letter extension on the end. That is the sidecar file that tells the system, the intelligence system, exactly what's in the wrapper for the video. If you separate those, you can get into a world of trouble. It uh, is yes. much more important to... I used to do nothing but image the whole card when I took an SD card out of a camera because it had the correct file structure for the system to understand both halves of that and get it right every time. So dragging in a finder video files is always bad juju. Just saying. Yeah. Next question. Uh, Michael Vosbeen says, I use iPhones with Switcher Studio to live stream to Facebook or YouTube, but there doesn't seem to be a good way to use the iPhone as a camera in Zoom meetings. Is there? Go ahead, Jeffrey. No, there, there really isn't. So I'm going to offer a different solution. That is, this is my, uh, this is my camera rig uh, for the at-homes. This is the Asus Zenfone 7. They have the Zenfone 8. And the best part about this is the camera actually flips out. So your main camera is also your selfie camera. And I just tested this when uh, when Zoom did HD option. I just tested this and it, <clears throat> it looks really great uh, for being a uh, phone camera right there. Our next question. Douglas Carmichael said, wouldn't the Achilles heel of phone production be the network you're on? I know that AT&T's unlimited plans can throttle if you're in areas of network congestion. Well, there's a lot of production. I mean, I think 90% of the production I do, I don't, I'm not trying to stream. I'm just doing, I'm just capturing stuff and then using it to, to do production. So for live, yeah, absolutely. If you push it too hard. Um, but uh, for most of us, we're doing, if we're doing something with the iPhone, we're not trying to stream it. Uh, go ahead, Bill. Absolutely. Having more memory on your phone, keeping those video files or, or whatever you're creating on the phone and then using, I use a simple lightning cable when I get back to roll it off the phone into Final Cut. So I'm not trying to stream live. That's a different thing. Next question. Matt Halverson in Brookings, South Dakota. How do I light people with deep set brown eyes? How do I make sure that I get a catch light reflected in their eyes without setting the light at eye level and pointing it straight at their face and blinding them? Reflection in glasses is also problematic. I go ahead, Guy. Yeah, a large source often put up high about a 45 degree angle or even closer to the camera. Yeah, some people use ring lights, but uh, a lot of the like 60 minute style interviews that you'll see is the light is 
uh, just off to the, the side of the camera. So in this example, you, you see in my eyes, I got this little catch light going on, and that is from that light right there. And you can see that uh, the prompter's right there, and the light's actually right there, and that's creating that little catch light that you're seeing. And good, Carl. So what I make sure is I make sure that the um, there's going to be a light. So I've got a, let's, say, let's say a softbox that may be two feet by three feet. I make sure that that softbox is at eye level or maybe one or two inches below eye level at the bottom of the softbox. The top of the softbox can be as high as you like, but the bottom of the softbox you want it either at essentially nose level um, for that person. So you need to adjust the softbox generally. This is if you want to do these kind of uh, images. So the best way to do it, and as far as glasses are concerned, so if you light it correctly, you'll be able to get a key light where you get a, a, a light in their eye um, and you have no reflection on their glasses. So it is actually quite easy to actually do this with people with darker eyes, but do make sure you get a key light in their eyes or their eyes are just a bit too dark. Um, but yeah, so here I've got the soft box and the soft, the bottom of the soft box is probably level um, with this gentleman's probably nose, bottom of the nose. Um, and then the soft box is probably another two feet above them shooting down. And I've got another soft box at the side, which you can probably see in that. But yeah, so I've got a key light in the eyes. I've got zero reflection in the glasses um, and I've got, lighting that's that's hitting evenly um even for someone with darker skin uh yeah go ahead bill and just don't forget the catch light doesn't have to be your illumination source you can light somebody perfectly and then bring in a small light that's of the correct size into the lights uh into uh the scene that doesn't really add much to the person but will form a catch light in their eyes it's interesting in those examples that carl uh, just gave us one of the things that I always love to do is look at photos and look at video shots and you can usually decode the lighting plot by purely the reflections in people's eyes. You're seeing two catch lights in my eyes because I have two panel lights sitting directly above and close to me, but they're relatively small. So that's really one way you can determine how people are lighting. It's a great tip. Yeah, the the um uh, the thing the thing you always want to keep on looking at is just remember that angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. So if you have a person sitting somewhere and you have a light, you're going to want to look at what is going to be down here <laughs> you know, for that for that thing, or if they're on the curves of their of their eyes, it may be different. But you're just thinking about that because as you move that light up and down, you're going to figure out where that reflection is going to go into the camera, you know, which is what you're trying to do. Large sources are easier. Uh, we usually use large sources, and what we do is we just move the light up until it until we lose it and then we come back a little bit. And I have to admit that's our quick adjustment. Um, next question. George Kennedy, Jr. in Washington, D.C. Has anyone tried or used iographer products for mobile? Is Are they worth a look? Uh, go ahead, George. So um, quick little backstory. The, the eye in the, in the iographer is actually for eye devices. So they look, Dave Basudo out of the Bay Area is actually was a teacher. And I remember a couple of decades ago, he was on the NAB show floor with an actual prototype of, it's gone beyond what the original was, but was a prototype. Alex, I would love to probably for you to probably get him on the educational hour, or even a second hour. He's definitely a really interesting and he's very uh, educational centric and he's a teacher. So I think we, uh, as we move on and really explore the mobile side, I would love to have you have him on for a conversation, yeah. maybe in a second or educational hour. Yeah, Dave and I are old friends. I'd love to oh, have him on. Oh, excellent, so, yeah. excellent. <laughs> so, yeah, so. I, I thought he was in Southern California. Is he north of California? Um, a sort of, I guess a Southern. I'm not sure, okay. sure exactly. Yeah, we should but, definitely um, have him on. Just, just put it in the second hour suggestion. Yeah, just remind I, me he's, of it. He's, he's, he's actually been very gracious to my son. He has met him a couple of times and, you know, he yeah. sends him tools to use in his productions. Right. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, iographer, and then of course, Padcaster is the other one uh, that that does the exact same thing for phones and for tablets. Yeah. Next question: Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, using the Rode Go Two as a USB interface into an Android phone, encounters issues with mono input and reverting back to the built-in mic, particularly with Zoom and non-native apps. Any tips for consistent USB contribution to third party, the particularly for the iPhone, iPad, to make it work better? Go ahead, Carl. So the one thing I've found that if you try to use these kind of row two goes or the Godox ones that I show as interfaces, where you're trying to put a line level in, um, not so good. So this is kind of where the Mix Pre 3 is king. Um, there is another way. So the Flow 8. So if, if you've actually got a Flow 8, you can actually just use a battery bank to power it. 
and it becomes a mobile solution then. Um, and then you can just plug that in. For, you know, Android is really cool, good with the USB kind of interface stuff. You won't have any problems. It will just work as a USB interface. You put it into streaming mode, gives you two inputs. You can actually put the 10, point, 10 inputs, of course, if the software can handle it. But yeah, battery bank with the Flow 8, if you own a Flow 8 or something similar, like i2i, um, 2i2, of course, but that will work. Yeah, next question. Ben Varnu, it looks like in Rosemont, uh, says, has the panel done any vertical or square aspect ratio productions? These aspect ratios seem to perform better in social media than 16 by 9. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, I've created several TikToks using my phone, uh, and it's kind of a trick to do it. So you basically have to record, of course, vertical, and then you can put it into the, uh, you put it into iMovie or something like that, and it'll turn it 90 degrees. I, I don't know, I haven't done it in a while, so hopefully, maybe they've changed that, but it turns at 90 degrees, you do your edits, and then when you're done, you go back into the video, and then you turn it back the uh, 90 degrees. And then you can put it out to your social social media and it works really well. Good, Bill. Yeah, I've had a couple of clients who needed a lot of vertical video. Often it was for digital signage. I used to do a lot of work for malls. And in those kind of circumstances, they had a lot of digital signage and we would have to produce uh, the same content for vertical, for outside the those kiosk signs, and then horizontal for different things. It gets to be a little bit of a problem because if you think about it, if you take the average of the vertical 16 by 9 and the horizontal 16 by 9 you only have a small square in the middle it kind of looks like the red cross symbol and you're protecting to try to get all of your content that's really important in that center square so it can be a framing challenge if you don't have i'm shooting for this format or that format if you're shooting vertical just remember i've had lots of problems with what jeffrey was talking about the camera puts a little orientation flag on it and if i need to get it into another thing or if for some reason i'm importing it and everything is sideways on the phone. I used to do a lot of rotation to try to get those right over time. So it, it tr experiment, 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 set up, know your workflow, know you where you're going and test, test, test before you decide you can just do it. I shoot in 4k for 16 by nine. And then I, and then I do pan and scan for nine by 16. That's, I mean, that's how I do nine by 16. <laughs> like I don't, I don't try to, I just shoot for 16 by nine and then I, and then I make it and then I just move things around. I literally sit in final cut and just animate the frame to where I want it to be um, as I need it. And I, uh, works really well. Next question. Jamie E. Uh, looks like in Georgia, Alpha, Alpharetta, Alpharetta, Georgia. I've used iPhones with Filmic Pro controlled with a best score motorized pan or tilt unit. I'd like to upgrade cams. The Blackmagic cams need motorized lenses. Any suggestions on configuration or can I rent iPhone 13s? Go ahead, Carl. Um, I'm pretty sure you actually can kind of rent iPhone 13s. Um, generally, it's usually the form one, so usually the one generation back to so iPhone 12 with the easy one to rent because people will just rent them out. You'll find these kind of websites where people will let, loan out their stuff. It's just like renting clothes in the same way. Um, Blackmagic does have some stuff in the works. There is an image that popped up on their website um, of a lens that doesn't exist, and it's on a camera that has full motorized zoom. So we are seeing some stuff that, I don't know if it's a leak on their website, but it's just marketing material on their website. Um, is it still there or did it just appear and disappear? It, it is. It's, I don't know if I want to show it or not, <laughs> but I won't tell you what page it's on. Give you a second, but I, I'll, I'll bring, tell us I'll bring it up. Put it up. It's their own fault. <laughs> it's like yeah, the internet. So it's basically public. It's it, public. it is there. The, the camera is the studio camera, the micro four thirds camera. So the camera, they have the USB in for the, the zoom demand and focus demand. Right. The lens, I looked at the lens and I went, I, and it's a native lens to micro four thirds. I know every micro four third lens that is like worth its salt, you know, to use in these. And, and this isn't one of them. This does not exist. It's not a cinema lens because Fujinon <laughs> makes cinema lenses with micro four third mounts. It's right. not one of those. Um, we do know that Blackmagic and Panasonic do have a relationship. Um, and so my feeling is this is actually, and it, there's, there's no markings on the lens. So it looks like a prototype lens because it doesn't have any of the aperture markings or focus scale markings. It's just like completely clear lens. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that it's not on the product page for the camera. So it's not on the camera's product page. If you go to the studio camera's product page, it's not there. It's on a accessory and it's just in the background. And it's, it's quite amazing. When I saw this lens, I went, that's, it looks like a B4 lens, micro four thirds mount. It has three rings. So not two, it doesn't have just focus and so it's not an SLR lens. It has a third ring for iris, um, but it doesn't say it, but it does have the three rings. You can tell the three rings are there and you can tell which one's which, you can tell which one's zoom, which ones. But the interesting thing I found is that there's no other images of this anywhere else kind of, but this is kind of what we were 
um, thinking was going to come. So, yeah, it's a pretty amazing looking lens. You can tell by the lens hood that it's it's got a long throw. Um, and also, it's, it's just, yeah, this is a studio camera, so you can tell it's a native mount. So this is a native micro four thirds. There's no adapter. You can tell it has a, a cinema rail on it. It's not a cinema lens because the cinema lens will not come with a lens hood like this. So this is a lens. I believe this is a lens from Panasonic, and I believe we'll hear more about this lens. But yeah, so this is what's coming as far as fully motorized, you know, control. A little, so little off the subject from, from, from iPhone, but I, what, what I will say, the only thing a comment I'll make is that if if they make this, uh, if they make lenses, if Blackmagic starts to release, yeah, oh, I see. Yeah, if they start to release lenses, they will sell as many as they can make, you know, for this. This, this market is so broken like the the micro four thirds for video market is so messed up and broken i hope that they make the big ones like that and then little ones and pancake ones and everything else because the, the the solutions out there are so bad that they could just they could just own this market uh go ahead bill well i was just going to note since he mentioned those best score motorized pan and tilt units which are, are reasonably simple ones um be careful because the black magic cinema cameras especially uh are pretty heavy and the 6k actually adds a lot more weight than i thought i was kind of surprised when i actually got mine in my hands so i'm not sure that those inexpensive best core motorized pan and tilt heads are going to do well over time with that much weight on it so just pay attention to that gopros and iphones no problem at all the best scores are pretty rough so just you know, you mean and think about the next level up one of the things i that i i think is to to look at with if you can get the remote control working which is a little bit more expensive is the i'm really looking closely at the dgi you know um the rsc2 is it rcs2 or rc rsc2 um that has and then i looked at the middle things controller i'm very interested in putting that on a couple cameras uh, so that's what we're kind of swirling around go ahead jeffrey Going back to the iPhone 13, yeah, you can rent them. I can rent them from the computer rental places. Uh, like I think there is actually computerrentals.com. Uh, it will just be the iPhone. However, there are some places, and I know a couple that are in Georgia, that uh, actually rent kits as in at-home kits. So you'll get the tripod and the phone and the microphone and all that other stuff with the uh, with the iPhone. Yeah, so that's um, that's, that was uh, fun. It was a good long, long discussion, a, a test of... Can we go longer than an hour? Uh, and I think we can I, you know, on certain subjects. So, um, so this was this was good. Um, were you going to say something, Chris? Yeah. Uh, next is C forty sevens. Exactly. <laughs> Proven we can do tape. Might go back to cable C forty sevens, and then the, the next thing will uh, you know? Now here's one that we could do that we I don't think we've done. Uh, crafty. I think I, I could talk for, for an hour about oh, crafty. Absolutely. Easy. Yeah. Well, there's a second hour there somewhere. Is what's that? Oh, catering. <laughs> Just catering for shows. Is Feeding we call it, people. We call it, we call it crafty, but yeah, catering catering for shows is a, something many of us who do a lot of shows could talk for a long time about, mostly kibitzing about it. You know, like that, but every once in a while, like if I like something like that, I take lots of pictures. That's all I, I love the fact that in LA, there are companies that will pull up a trailer throw down the back, throw open the doors, and it's just a trailer full of snacks. Like, yeah. it's just a snack. I'm not even giving you meals. I'm just a trailer full of snacks. I love that. The best one, I've done, well, then we'll leave. The, the best crafty that I had a couple, uh, maybe six months ago or whatever, and I took tons of photos and got cards and everything else, was this Mexican restaurant that does, they make um, they make tacos. And you never have it. It's too messy to have it like in the middle of the shoot. So it's like the I've always seen them. This one place always gets them when we work at the end of the show. I mean, at the you know the, the last thing if you're going to feed the crew on before they do the the rollout or whatever. And um, it is uh, they make they literally make the torti the the tortillas for it or the 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 corn um, pieces for it uh, fresh. So there's a guy sitting there just whacking out these these tortillas and there's someone rolling them and then it's everything super fresh and it is. It is the best. Anyway, so it's a mobile tortilleria. Yeah, it's like, like it you have is in Tijuana. So good, so mm. good. Yeah. 
Anyway, you can hire those to, in San Diego to, to cater your party. It's fabulous. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks to our producers for um, all the great questions and uh, driving the conversation forward. I, our producers, I just as I decided in the middle of the show that the producers are just more focused on the phone. It's a very popular subject. Um, the producers are more focused on the phone than they were on general questions, and so we just decided to move early to the second hour because there was tons of questions for the second hour and. Uh, and not as many questions in the first hour. And so we, we, and so for the producers, you need to know that that's kind of like, if, if we're just stacked up with them and we don't have a lot of, fun, we'll just start early. I mean, we have to not do that very often, but um, when I really see it, a groundswell there. And, um, and then also we talk slower and go over when there's no questions for the second hour. So that's kind of just how we are managing that. This is the first time we've ever, I think, started early or that early um, in there, but it just seems, and, and the really well done by the panelists of just being on point answering a lot of a lot of great questions because part of it was we just answered a lot of questions quickly and uh, the, the producers couldn't keep up with the first hour <laughs> as fast as then there was a big big panel i wasn't expecting that so anyway great work by the panelists today we can't do it without you all right um, we are now going to jump into after hours we talked a long time about phones and stupid stories have a great day I don't know if we had that many stupid stories, but we had stories. It's nice seeing you, Carl. It's great to have Carl back. Yay, Carl. Hey, Carl. Carl. Can we just get him a job in California so he's in the proper time zone? Because we need to hire Carl. Send him a different clock so he doesn't know the difference. Maybe he can work in Seattle. Guy, what do you think? Oh, okay. Come to Seattle. We have cookies. Oh, and good good coffee. What was here also? Right here.